Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Vedic astrologer Ernst Wilhelm. Ernst has had an avid interest in astrology since the age of 12 and has spent his life studying Western and then Vedic astrology. He is the author of several books, including Classical Muhurta, which is considered the most complete and far-reaching book available on the subject. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind and live their dreams. And now here is Paul and Ernst with Real Astrology. Hello, welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. It's great to be back. And today we are going to talk about real astrology. And I've got a real treat for you because I have a real astrologer with us today. His name is Ernst Wilhelm. And we were just figuring out that we have been working together and known each other since probably around 1998. And I would say Ernst is a real astrologer. And one of the things I wanted to share right up front as I roll into my introduction with Ernst is that I had been studying astrology, but I kept finding that Western astrology just seemed very out of character for me. And then, of course, I didn't have a lot of faith in the astrology readings in newspapers and stuff for a variety of reasons. So my studies led me to investigating Vedic astrology. And so my first thought is, are there any Vedic astrologers around? So I started hunting around, and lo and behold, I found a book in a local bookshop called Vault of the Heavens, and it just turned out that the author was right in my hometown. So I made contact with him, had him do a reading on me, and it was the first time I ever had an astrology reading that really shocked me, actually. It was like Ernst was looking into my soul. <laughs> and I, and I was very aware that something was going on that was very different than Western astrology. And that developed uh, my interest in Ernst's work. And then I began having clients, particularly people with cancer and things like that, that just weren't responding to treatment. And I'll never forget a particular case. And I just it just dawned on me as I was working with this lady after several months. And just noticing that she wasn't responding to therapy, no matter what approach I took. So I thought, I'm going to see what Ernst has to say, because he's also a medical astrologer. And so I got her data and got a reading from Ernst. And the long and short of it was, in Ernst's report, he said, based on her alignments, in about three months, things should start clearing for her, and you might notice a change. And so I wrote that down in my schedule, and literally within a day of three months, the woman gave me a call, and she said, you know, I don't know why, but all of a sudden I'm starting to feel a lot better. (laughs) I about fell out of my chair because I had written it right on the calendar and was waiting to see what would happen. And so that was my second awakening to Ernst's accuracy, and so uh, I've always had a deep interest in Ernst and his real astrology. So Ernst, welcome to Living 4D with me, <laughs> Paul hey, Check. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for inviting me. It's way out time overdue that we get together. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've always really loved you and your work, but you know, life just takes you like a storm and, you know, you wake up and realize like last time we were chatting, we both kind of realized, wow, a lot's gone down since we were last talking to each other. It's just kind of wild how it all goes. And before I get too far in, Ernst, you've got a number of books. I mentioned one of them. Could you share the titles? Because as I said earlier, I don't want to screw the names up. Sure. The one you mentioned, Vault of the Heavens, that's like a um, you know, a entry book to get people familiar with astrology. So it's like a good first book for people. I loved it. I still have it. Uh huh. Then I have a book called Graha Sutras. And Graha is what we call the planets in Vedic astrology. And Sutras is like the old Sanskrit, um, you know, you know, the old Sanskrit lines and the old Sanskrit books. 
And those books are written in very brief Sanskrit, and they're written to really spend a lot of time studying one sentence or one sutra. So it's basically a compilation of the planetary lines from the ancient books with a lot of commentary and a lot of depth and a lot of exploration. And that's really what I consider one of my most important books because there's a lot of misinformation on the planets out there and this clears it up. Okay. And that's Great. also like an entry level book for people or, or advanced people learn a lot, but it's like one a beginner could jump into and have fun with. Um, the other books I have are a little more advanced. One is called Core Yogas. And a yoga is a planetary permutation in the chart that causes us to have some effect. So you can have like a yoga for success or a yoga for intelligence. So that talks about more getting into reading the chart um, through the planetary positions, basically. And that's not too difficult of a book either. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, then there's a book called Jaimini Sutras. And Jaimini, um, Jaimini Sutras Ra. And Jaimini was an author from 300 to 600 BC that wrote really part of the most important astrology book in coded Sanskrit. And so um, I'm one of the people who's tried to decode that Sanskrit into a meaningful body of knowledge. So that's a, obviously an advanced book. And then the last book I have is Classical Mahurta. And Mahurta is what they call electional astrology in the West. Those are the rules for saying you want to get married. What's a good day to get married? You're, you're going to take a girl out. What's a good day? You're going to start a good business, start a new business. What's a good day to start it? And that's a more advanced system of astrology, too. It, it takes a lot of focus. But um, those books I all wrote um, by 2004. Since then, really, I've been teaching everything on video and um, audio. I have like 1,500 hours of courses, multiple manuals that go way and beyond those books. And so you also have some software programs. Are those software programs, I remember, isn't there a program that you have where people can get a reading through the internet? Um, we have a couple of things. Once we have the software for students and professional astrologers, that's something you put on your computer and you can use to calculate charts and stuff. Um, then we have a website, vaultoftheheavens.com. And on that website, we sell a few reports that I've written. Um, there's, it's mostly focused on um, compatibility relationship reports at this time. I have a lot of other reports I plan on writing. I just haven't gotten around to them, you know? Yeah. So we're still building that site up, but we have some, um, you know, good relationship reports there, relationship-centered reports, and some a calendar that lets you kind of see the days that little events could happen throughout your year. Okay. So you have a number of websites listed here. We'll put those all in the show notes so you don't have to go through all of them and give all the long URLs and all that. But uh, the good news is for those that are really interested in real astrology teachings and readings, you've got a lot of offerings and you've got a lot of offerings on the internet as well. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of things I want to talk to you about with astrology. I think, you know, just a few thoughts that come right off my head. You know, astrology is, has been really a big part of our history. And we used to navigate by the stars before we had compasses and even, of course, iPhones. People, you know, I find it interesting today. A lot of people have no idea what direction north is in. They just simply don't know. And um, mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. Being a guy that, you know, grew up on a farm and spent a lot of time in the woods, you always kind of want to know where north is at. But uh, it's very well known that emperors and kings and movie stars and business moguls have used astrologers for as long as historical record goes back. And, you know, you, you, your story of, of Buddha and how his father had an astrology reading done on him to figure out who this guy was going to be. And we, you know, I think we already know what happened there, but that was one of the two outcomes, the astrology reading. I think he said he was going to be a, some kind of great spiritual teacher. I don't remember what the other option was. Do you? Yeah. I'm um, either a great king or a great spiritual being. Yeah. I guess. I'd like to roll into a whole bunch of questions and, and really part of what I wanted to do with you today is, is clarify some of the distinctions or differences between Western astrology, Eastern astrology, 
but at the core, what astrology really is. Because today, astrology, like mythology, has really kind of been pushed by the scientific materialist mindset into something kind of airy fairy, silly. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't believe in it at all. And I've even had people make negative comments to me for referencing astrological influences and things like that. So, regardless of people's opinion of astrology, there's a few things that we should all consider in respect to astrology. So I've got a few things, and I'll I'll, I'll list them, and then I'll let you uh, go ahead and make a statement. Um, for the majority of human life on Earth, as I said, stars were the key means of navigation. Biblically speaking, the three magi came to Jesus because they saw, had seen his arrival in the stars. We talked about Buddha. We talked about the emperors and the kings. We know a lot of movie stars have astrologies, as do musicians and business moguls. In fact, uh, a number of years ago, one of my best friends bought me an astrology reading with a guy named Hassan Jeffers. Have you ever heard of him? Don't know him. Yeah, he's a pretty famous astrologer. He was Larry King's personal astrologer and worked for a lot of famous people. Had a beautiful office on like the 20th floor in downtown Toronto. You know, that office must have cost him 10 grand a month or more, but he did an astrology reading on me. And when I came in to his office, the first thing he said when he met me, he says, do you know that your astrology chart is almost identical to two famous people? And I said, no, who are they? He said, Carl Jung and Madonna. And I about shit myself because I've been studying Carl Jung for probably 25 years. And I used to be on vacation with Penny and I would have always carry Jung's books with me to study while we were driving. She likes to drive because she gets car sick. So I get to sit there and read. And I would read passages out of Jung's book and say, where have you heard this before? Then I'd read it to her. She goes, that sounds exactly like something you said. And it was, it was kind of like weird because there was so many parallels in how I thought. But then when I got that information from Jeffers, and I've always loved Madonna because she speaks her truth, you know. That said, when I went through his reading, it, it just did not, for example, compared to the reading you gave me, it was like I it was it was so it could have been anybody and and probably 60% of it didn't sound like me at all so one of the first thoughts that went through my head is i i should get another reading from ernst it would be probably a lot more accurate although he did figure out who two of my favorite people were so if you have an opening statement ernst as to the validity of astrology what would you say yeah, I think the blanket statement I use is that astrology is never at, never at fault. It's always the astrologer who makes the mistakes. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> you know, and one of the things that when it comes to all this occult stuff and, 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 and spiritual stuff these days, everyone is expecting these things that are floating around are the absolute perfected forms of these things. But the reality is they're really not. You know, all the sciences, really are in a big state of decay, whether they're occult sciences or material sciences, medical sciences. We're really at a place and time where we are developing these sciences after a lot of decay in the dark ages. Um, and so, first of all, astrology is not available as a perfected form. There's a few people who are really trying to perfect it. But, you know, 99% of the people walking around calling themselves astrologers are just satisfied using really what it comes down to it, a systems of astrology that are not that, um, that need a lot of work still. And they do that in Western astrology, Vedic astrology, any type of astrology you name. So it's not that Vedic astrology is better than Western astrology. It's really how deep is the astrologer going? How thirsty is the astrologer for knowledge? And just like in your field, you know, you're like <clears throat> crazy about nutrition. And there's a lot of nutritionists out there who aren't crazy about nutrition, you know? Right, yeah. And, and when someone talks to them, they're going to get a completely different experience than when they come talk to you about nutrition. And it's, it's the very same thing when you go to astrologer. So the second thing I'd like to say is to not blame Western astrology or Vedic astrology or 
Egyptian astrology or Greek astrology. Blame the astrologer that's right in front of you that did a good job. Blame him for doing a good job and, and blame the bad ones for doing a bad job. Because it really is only that astrologer that makes the mistake. And we have a lot to learn. And one of the sad things I find in astrology is that a lot of people like to walk around thinking that they have this perfect system of astrology, just like, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses walk around thinking Jehovah's Witness religion is perfect, you know? Yeah. There's no perfect religion out there. No. And there's no perfect a system of astrology. But there's a few people who are trying to push the envelope, and I happen to be one of the people who tries to push it, you know? And so um, I find a big problem is that a lot of astrologers simply don't go deep enough. And for an astrologer to really impact a the person, they have to go really deep into the person or they have to make really amazing predictions. And that's, that's hard to find astrologers who can do that consistently and all the time. The other thing is, at the end of the day, you know, we really are set up to have the experiences we're meant to have. So one time we go to an astrologer, we have a profound experience. Another time we go, and we don't have a profound experience because it's not what our life was calling for. It's not what the divine has set us up for. And sometimes the divine sets us up to have a terrible reading because somehow that's what we need to take the next step on our journey. <laughs> maybe, maybe force us to look into ourselves instead of asking someone else. Yeah, and that, it does it that sometimes. And I remember really one of my most fondest readings. I was when, back when I lived in Encinitas and I ran out of the house. Excuse me. I was walking down the street and the woman comes running out of the house. Ernst, Ernst, I need you. Well, she didn't mean me for anything like, really great, but she wanted me to read her chart. So she of asked course. me, can you read my chart? So I say, sure. And I walked to my house a couple blocks away, grabbed my computer, came to her house, and I looked at her chart. And she told me she was devastated over this breakup. And I, I looked at her chart and I said, next year, you're going to have your best relationship. The relationship that's going to work is going to happen next year. And I, I gave her the date, May of next year or something. I remember what month. It was about a year away. She said, oh, okay, I can manage that. Two years later, she calls me and she says, um, remember that time you did a reading for me and um, I was so depressed over so-and-so and you said I would meet a guy if that would be the right guy for me in a year? I said, yeah. She goes, well, I never met anybody. And I'm like shrinking in my chair going, oh, and I'm, I'm saying, I'm sorry. I'm trying to say, I'm about to say, I'm sorry. I, I failed the prediction. And she goes, oh, no, no, no. I'm not calling to complain. She said, that reading was the best thing that ever happened to me because I was I, I had spent my whole life dwelling on love, longing for love, never living my life as myself. And when you told me I was going to meet a guy in a year, I said, wow, I, just one year, I can wait that. And for the first time in my life, I got focused on who I am, what's important to me. I discovered I love to sing opera. And now I'm, I'm singing in operas. I'm so happy that... I don't even care if I ever meet a guy again. <laughs> and, and she said, and if, if I hadn't, if I hadn't have thought that I was going to meet a guy, I would have never focused on that. I would have just sat around and pined away like I'd done my whole life. So see, sometimes it's the bad prediction that the person needs. <laughs> <laughs> that's the divine providence. <laughs> exactly. And that's really the beauty of being an astrologer is that as you, we read charts, we never know if our prediction, how our predictions are going to help people. And I've, I've told people predictions to the exact day and, you know, and I've failed predictions. But what has really been surprising to me is watching the benefits to the people. And more often than not, I succeed. That was one of the memorable times I failed. But it just shows that at the end of the day, the person is going to get what they need to get if the astrologer approaches with the attitude that they just want to help the person in their life and on their path. Some astrologers don't have that attitude, though. A lot no. of astrologers just want to show off and how good they are at making predictions. Um, but I never cared about that. I was just there, however I can help you get down the road, because that's what I'm here for, you know? Yeah. And if that makes me fl floundering a prediction, I'm happy to do it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's honest love. <laughs> You know, because it's really about the client and it's about the words that the God stick in our mouth. So when she told me that at two years later, I looked at her chart, I pulled her chart up and I looked and I said, how did I fail that prediction? And I looked, and I said, what? Why did I say 
she would meet someone in this period. I said, this is the period that the first thing I talk about when I say you're in this period to my students, I say, this is the loneliest period of your life. You will not meet anyone ever. And for some reason, when I saw that same period in her chart, I said she would meet someone. <laughs> and it's like, I've also had that happen with, I had another woman a few months before this, I had a friend call me and say, um, my friend is really devastated. Her boyfriend totally dumped her for another girl. And can you do a reading? I looked at her chart. And usually when I see people's relationships didn't work, I know that the person needs a lot of guidance and how to have relationships. They did something wrong. But I looked at this chart. I like this ch woman had a wonderful chart. And I said, you know, usually when people break up, I try to talk to them about what they can do to have better future relationship. I said, but you, I got nothing to tell you. You're perfect. You know, you're a, you're a great catch. You're, you're any guy who's with you is going to be so lucky. You got nothing to learn. You just need the right guy. This wasn't the right guy. The only thing I can tell you to help you get through this painful period is that on January 28th, the guy you're going to marry is going to show up. So a year later on January 28th, exactly a year later from the January 28th, I predicted my friend calls me up and said, yeah, I wanted to tell you my friend just got engaged on her one year anniversary of meeting a guy who on the day you predicted, came into her work carrying flowers and said, I'm here to, to, to ask you out on January 28th, exactly the day you said. And she's now engaged and she, they're really happy. So I got, my, I got my, my chart, her chart and I looked at him like, oh, how did I, that's a great prediction, predicting the exact day. So I, um, I looked at the chart and I looked, I'm like, how, why did I predict that? I couldn't even find out why. I couldn't remember why I predicted it. It made no sense to me that I would have predicted that. But literally when we go, when an astrologer is doing a reading, his mind, our minds go into a different dimension, you know? Yes, I know exactly. So this is a mean. person where the divine was saying, yeah, this person you want, you know, needs to know this. And another person needs to know something else. And we use astrology, but our intelligence during a reading can get so much more open than it is on a normal day-to-day -day basis. And an astrologer is called a, 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 going to an astrologer in India is called a Deva Prajna, which literally means a consultation with the Devas, with the, or the deities or the gods. <laughs> yeah, doesn't Prajna mean wisdom? Prajna means like a question or a consultation. Okay. Yeah. In, in Zen Buddhism, it means wisdom i think okay yeah it could well be that because it is about a query to gain knowledge and wisdom yeah yeah that's interesting well i already love the level of honesty you're sharing with us <laughs> um you know there's more magic in almost everything than meets the eye I'd, I'd love it if you could share an overview of your background and your studies and what led you to uh not only having a trust in astrology you must have some degree of trust or you wouldn't have devoted your life to it but becoming a professional astrologer and an author on the topic so just like how did this happen for you you know yeah well i kind of started out i think a lot like you did you know i started out as an athlete you know as a kid um and from there i moved on to nutrition and massage and i was working with athletes worked with some gold medalists and you know silver olympic medalists worked with some top athletes i'm um, just doing massage and nutrition um and then i fell in love and then that went that <laughs> went to happens. hell that, that, went, <laughs> that, happens that too. was like bad news right <laughs> and but the year before that a few months before that i was doing martial arts and the week I decided to leave. I was living with a friend and he said, well, you should see my astrologer. She'll talk, my friend who's an astrologer, have your chart read. So she read my chart for about 90 minutes on the phone. And this is back when it cost like 30 cents a minute to call. And 30 cents was actually, you could actually buy a candy bar for 25 cents, not $2, right? Yeah. So it got expensive fast. So after 90 minutes, my friend is like pulling me off the phone because he was paying for the phone call. I was totally broke. And, um, but the astrologer lived halfway between his house and my house, like 700 miles away, right in the middle of where I was going the next morning. So she invited me to come stay. 
And I was thinking, oh, this is great. I'm going to go to her house and she's going to read my chart for hours. You know, so she just started after 90 minutes. She was telling me so much. And she was a Western astrologer. She was really good. And I got to her house and she cooked me a vegetarian meal when she found out I was vegetarian. And then she, um, you know, finally she takes me to her office. I'm like, goody, more chart. She sat me down and she taught me how to calculate a chart. Oh. And then she gave me books on how to calculate charts, all the mathematical books you need, all the ephemeris of the planetary positions. And then she gave me this little course manual that she used to teach her students. And then she fed me dinner, put me to bed, woke me up at 6 a.m. and kicked me out the door. <laughs> That's a ghost and I'm, I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, what about my chart, right? Yeah. So a year later, when I'm brokenhearted, miserable, wondering if I should jump off the cliff or use the knife, you know, just totally <laughs> in pain over some girl, you know, who never cared about me, you know, <laughs> I, I called my mom up and I said, can you send me those books? They're in the closet in this room. So my mom sends me these books and I start getting into the astrology. And then within a short time, I went from this, I got no reason to live to, wow. This all makes sense. I totally get why I met her, why I needed to meet her. And I just was able to process it so well that at that point, I was like, wow, fasting, nutrition, when it comes down to shit like this, doesn't do any good. And in fact, I fasted three weeks in March and it didn't help me deal with her at all. (laughs) (laughs) So so at that point, there's certain people you don't want to tell that to because it'll be like telling a vegan they need to eat meat. Yeah. So, you know, it didn't cure my love problem, but astrology (laughs) did. And so I came out of that thinking, wow, I'm going to be an astrologer. This is like the, this thing has helped me more than anything else. This is what (laughs) has worked for me. And so of course, because it worked for me, it's what I wanted to do all the time. So at that point, I just knew I was an astrologer, haven't questioned it since, haven't looked back since. And I got on the road of, of just focusing on astrology every spare minute of my life, pretty much. How And how long have you been doing this now? Well, that was 1992. So we're talking 30 years now. Yeah. 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 And I was 22. Uh, it was right before my 22nd birthday that I started studying it seriously. And it was right. Let's see. I think I was. I was 20 when the woman taught me how to read the chart and stuff. That's or how to calculate the chart. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because you and I do have a similar beginnings working with athletes, massage therapy, nutrition, exercise. And I found my career path at 22, um, when I became the trainer of the army boxing team in January, 1984. So I've been at it for 38 (laughs) years now. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. I love hearing the story of, of all, I love to see what what inspires people to become, you know, especially when you have a passion that holds your interest for that long. To me, that's a real soul path. Yeah, it's really, I feel real lucky um, that I've had a a passion and interest that still feeds me after 30 years. Um, And that's not common. I think anyone who has that is really spoiled in that respect, you know? (laughs) Yeah, either that or they're listening to their inner guidance system and, and, they're, they're, you know, I think the thing too, is you, you know, as well as anybody being on your path doesn't mean it's an easy path. I mean, I've been through hell to get to where I'm at and we, <clears throat> the difference is, is if you do what you love to do, then it's a labor of love and that's sustainable. But if you just keep chasing money, then you find yourself laboring and laboring and laboring. And even when you have money, you're not happy because you're not following your heart's compass. You're just chasing money. Now, there is differences for sure between Eastern and Western astrology, because I I found that out just doing my own investigations and looking at the differences in the readings. Um, One of the things that I found in my investigations in some of my books, because I have a whole section on astrology in my library, and I, I can't remember exactly the technical aspects of this, but some of the authors said that the Western astrologers haven't accounted for the procession of the equinox. Could you explain the differences between Western and Eastern astrology? And if that's correct about the equinox, maybe you can dial us in on that. 
First of all, that's not a difference between Western and Eastern astrology. Most people think it is, and it's commonly called the difference between Eastern and Western. The reason is because the majority of Indian astrologers from India use what's called the sidereal zodiac, and the majority of Western astrologers use the tropical zodiac. Okay. Now, your sun sign that everyone knows is based on the tropical zodiac. Okay. Now, the sidereal zodiac is about 23 degrees different. So basically, you'd have to subtract 23 degrees from your sun. So usually with the sidereal zodiac, your sun sign is the previous sign. Right. Maybe you can just back up one step and clear us on exactly the meaning of the zodiac i know i'm I'm imagining you're reading talking about the constellations of the zodiac the 12 constellations what's the difference between the sidereal and the other one okay so the sidereal what they do is they like to the idea is that the constellations are related to the stars the tropical holds the idea that the you know the zodiac the 12 signs of the zodiac are related to the Earth's sphere and the movement of the sun. So basically, one idea is there's a star there, and that star is Gemini. And that dark stars, that group of stars is Scorpio. Okay? That's the sidereal idea. And we put our planets are considered in those star groups. The tropical idea is that as if we imagine we have the Earth, and the Earth has an equator, and the sun moves like this around the earth now the sun doesn't move like this it moves at an angle around the earth so it comes in as it moves north the sun crosses the equator then it gets to a point of highest north which is the tropic of cancer and then it drops south and crosses the equator again so the tropical zodiac is the idea that where the sun crosses the equator that's the beginning of aries and the beginning of libra so the signs of the zodiac are relevant to the sun earth movement. Now, in India, most people use the sidereal zodiac and in the west most people use the tropical. But there's a lot of pe- astrologers in the west that use the sidereal. And there's a lot of astrologers in India, some not not a lot, not a majority, but there's some that use the tropical. And this debate on what zodiac is correct has been going on for more than 2,000 years. It's wow. been And it's been going on in every country that ever did astrology. In fact, if we read Ptolemy's astrology books, he talks about both of those zodiacs, plus another one that the Greeks were using at the time, trying to figure out which is right. One of the biggest problems we have in astrology is that There's no agreement on which way to even calculate the zodiac, not even within Indian astrologers or not even within Western astrologers. Okay, so there's a lot of reasons for that, which I don't want to get into because they're very technical and historically. But one thing I will say is that the name of the stars, Aries, Taurus, constellations, as we see in our astronomical almanacs in, you know, these days, those names of the stars were created by the Greeks around 300 BC. Before that, those stars were never called that. That's interesting. In all ancient cultures, those stars had different names. And there was was more this specific star and maybe a couple group stars around it. And like if we look at the constellation Scorpio, it's way more than 30 degrees long. You know, the idea is if you have 360 degrees of circle, you divide it by 12, you have 12 30 degree signs. But the reality is Aries is like a little tiny piece of pizza, you know? Right. And Scorpio is like this huge piece of pizza that I want to eat, you know? Uh-huh. And, and so the, the, the idea that these stars are certain constellations, they don't even fit into the constellational space when we use the sidereal zodiac. Now... Um, I personally do not believe in the sidereal zodiac. I used to. But then when I started reading the ancient books um, from India, there was more evidence in those ancient books that the Indian astrologers used the tropical zodiac. So I tested every technique I had learned, and every single technique tested out better with the tropical zodiac. So at that point, I completely divorced myself from the sidereal zodiac, and I've been using the tropical. 
So, but the main thing is the techniques. The biggest difference between Western astrology and Eastern astrology is the techniques. Western astrology uses techniques that are based on Persian and Greek astrology. Vedic astrology uses techniques that are completely different. We have different aspects. We have different ways we look at the charts. Um, we, we take different divisions of the charts. We have, if we count, if we, if I printed out your entire Vedic astrology report of what I printed, of what I programmed so far, I'm going to give you a big stack of paper. You know, I'm going to give you 20 times as many pieces of paper as you're going to get with calculating everything that Western astrologers use. There's just so much more. And it's not that India is better for astrology. The only difference is in the Western world, most of the astrological knowledge was destroyed. When they burnt the Library of Alexandria and when the Christians came through and all this other stuff, that didn't happen in India. And India is the biggest library of occult knowledge. And that's what's special about India. It's not that the Indians knew better. The Indians, the Arabs and Greeks, they were trading astrology 2,000 years ago. But what happened is all the, astro all the astronomical and astral knowledge in the West got so destroyed. India never lost the knowledge that the Earth was round. I have books from 1,500 years ago that talk older than that that talk about the spherical nature of the Earth relevant to the whole cosmos, you know? Um, so there's an amazing amount of knowledge that was lost in the Western world. So when we, that's why when we print all the stuff we can print from Indian textbooks on your astrology chart, we're going to get a giant stack because those books weren't burned. In the West, most of the books got burned, you know? And in fact, we have in Indian astrology, in India, we have something called the Tajika system of astrology. The Tajika are the Persians, is what they used to call the Persians. And that's a perfectly preserved Persian system of astrology, just like the Greek and Persian astrology used 2000, 2,500 years ago, which developed into modern Western astrology. And we have that in India, too. So we have everything that's in Western astrology in India, somewhere in some book, plus things that got burnt in, West, in the West. I think these things were available to the Western astrologers a long time ago. But this knowledge got lost. And then different cultures choose to use different techniques based on the need of that culture and forget other techniques. And so astrology is in a constant state of flux. It's like nutrition. Depending on what the people are eating as a primary diet, we need different medical, um, medical um, programs for them. We need different medical applications, different medical therapies, right? Yeah. You know, like we need a high, we, we're in an age where people eat a lot of grains. We're, we're going to need a completely different medical system than an age where people are eating mostly fruits and vegetables. And with astrology, it's the same. Depending on what's life coming, what's going on in the culture psyche, we need a completely different astrology techniques. And that's why different cultures have preserved and used different techniques compared to other ones. One of the most amazing Bioptimizers products I've ever used is Biome Breakthrough, which used to be called Leaky Gut Guardian. I can honestly say I use it every single day. I have a morning routine. I put a scoop in with two fresh squeezed limes. I put a little bit of other ingredients that I like in there. And I'll tell you what, if any of you have read my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, and you know how to read your poops, well, Biome Breakthrough makes for some really nice poopy policemen. I've got Wade here to tell us what's so unique about it, but I want to tell you right up front, I love this stuff. I don't go anywhere without it, and I keep a lot of it on hand so I don't run out. So Wade, what is it that's making that product so effective? Well, first and foremost, we have to look at what's happening in the population at large. And Harvard just released an extensive study demonstrating that virtually everyone has some degree of leaky gut. And that means the gut permeability of our intestines is leaking toxins into the system, which are causing immuno responses. Now, some people that's sneezing or allergies, but then it can move on to more inflammatory conditions. And anybody that's checked out your work understands this. The question is, how do you actually seal the gut so that you can stop this from happening? And we have a 
partnership with Birch International University in Croatia, where we have a team of PhD scientists working on this. And we've been able to combine a unique product called IGY Max, which is a patented egg-based product that enhances your gut health and reverses the damage that can be done by all these toxins that are leading to leaky gut. But when we combined it with some specific probiotics, they work synergistically together to be able to repair leaky gut in literally hours as opposed to going through an extensive protocol. Now, we can't stop ourselves from experiencing all the toxins in our world or food, air, water, you name it. It's coming from everywhere nowadays. So what we have to look at is, is well, how do we manage the damage, if you will, that we are taking, even if we're following you know, the highest levels of, of food hygiene and you know, conscientiousness. And so what's happened is Biome Breakthrough has been able to be proven In the lab and in folks, research papers will be coming out very soon to demonstrate this. And that's why we've called it Biome Breakthrough. We're able to actually repair and stop the leaky gut from happening with the combination of IGY Max. It's a unique set of probiotics. And we're happy to deliver it to people. We're very excited. We can try it. It's a money back guarantee. If you don't feel better, if your poops aren't better, if you don't say, wow, my my inflammatory conditions in my gut are going down, uh, you get your money back. So it's really easy to get. You go to biomebreakthrough.com slash living40. You'll get put in Paul 10. You get a 10% discount on this and any other products that we supply at Bioptimizers. I can't recommend it enough. I love this stuff. And it actually tastes good too, which is unique. So thank you very much once again for making such an amazing product. I'm really excited to be able to offer it to everybody. Enjoy Biome Breakthrough. I think it's important for the whole family. You said something earlier. You talked about <clears throat> the sun moving around the earth. Uh, but I think just to clarify, the, the earth's actually moving around the sun. It's just the way it appears to us is what you meant, right? Yes. From our point of view, it looks like everything's moving around us. But of course, we're moving around the sun, scientifically speaking. But astrology is all about how everything's influencing where we are. So everything in astrology is calculated from the earth being the center of the universe. Yeah, because we don't live on the sun. If we lived on the sun, we would calculate everything from the sun's point of view. Yes. Now, I may have had this in the questions later on, but it's pestering me. So I'm going to give it to you now. The, The actual star constellations that are attributed to Leo, Virgo, Cancer, Gemini, etc., are those stars actually considered to be the source of the psychic or energetic influences, or are they just representations of an archetypal energy or some other form of energy that just happens to be attributed to that zone of the sky? Okay, so everything out there that has an energy source is having an impact on every other part of the galaxy. Same way in your body. If I stick a needle in any part of your body, it's going to impact every part of your body somehow. Yes, it will. Okay. So it's the same with the the universe. You know, when everything that's happening out there affects everything else, there is no separation within this organism of the universe. Okay. Right. So all these stars are emitting energy and the whole universe is flooded with energy. And this energy ultimately is intelligent. It's not this, it's not like, it's not this, we think of energy as something that has no intelligence to it. Energy is intelligent in in an astronomical world. So it's really more like you're speaking of consciousness. Exactly. The energy is consciousness. The energy and consciousness are this, you can't separate them. You know, energy can never be destroyed. It only can change form, right? Right, yep. Same with consciousness. So imagine that, All these lights you're seeing are emitting this conscious energy, this energy that has consciousness, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the primary source of that energy in our solar system is the sun. 70% of all the energy that we're getting is from the sun. 30% is everything else that exists, okay? So... While, yes, those stars will have an impact, the energy radiating from Sirius, from radiating from every star out there will have an impact. 
when we add every one of those other stars up, it's only 30% of the pie. So obviously, they're relatively unimportant. Comparatively, yeah. Comparatively. So we have to start with the main thing. It's like when we look at a person, we start with the main things. Are you male or female? <laughs> are, you, are you interested in this or this? You know, it's a minor thing what color your hair is. So with astrology too, that's why I really believe in our solar system centered astrology where it's all relevant to, most of the important stuff is relevant to our solar system. Now, a lot of these stars out there that people like to use as markers, they work as markers as well, but only temporarily because we're moving relevant to those markers. We're moving slowly, but we are moving. So those markers will be accurate for a few hundred years, and then we need to reset them, okay? Um, and the ancients did use those as visual markers. And that caused a lot of confusion of creating the idea of a sidereal zodiac. But there's, there's, in fact, we have the zodiac of Aries, Taurus, Gemini, and so on. They use that in India. They use that in Persian astrology. They use that in Greek astrology. They use it in Western astrology. However, that's not even the original division, the original zodiac of India. Long before the idea of Aries, Taurus, and Gemini entered India, we had a zodiac based on the idea of different sun gods. And each sun god was traveling through the sky for one month with a bunch of friends. He had, <laughs> an, he, yeah, he had a Naga friend. Nagas, a, Nagas are the serpentile race from the myths of India. He had a Rishi. Rishis are the the Wise patrons men. of humanity and the lawgivers of humanity. Mm -hmm. He had a Gandharva with him, which is a heavenly musician. He had um, an Apsara, which are the heavenly dancers, the heavenly nymphs. And then he had a Rakshasa, which are the opponents of the, of the, of the devas, the deities, who's always fighting them in cosmic wars. <laughs> wow. and, um, and then he had a Yaksha, which is a nature spirit which were used to be very, very important in ancient India, which are nobody knows anything about them anymore. But each of these was a symbol of the sign. So now we say Aries lives in, you know, lives in rocky places. Aries has a large body. Aries is fiery. You know, we have these symbols that we use. But in the old system, the symbols they used was these divine beings. And I'm actually doing a project now of, resurrecting this ancient zodiac from India, not to replace the Aries towards Gemini zodiac, but to add a whole nother level of definition to our experiences, to the zodiac. It's just like enriching the symbology. So like I said, astrology needs a lot of development, you know? So the idea of Aries towards Gemini, these are not the most ancient ideas on the zodiac of an idea of a zodiac there's a lot of other things out there yeah there's also the lunar zodiac that divide of 27 parts of the sky mm. have, that all have their own stories and symbology behind it so it's very in this whole zodiac thing there's a lot to it and it's it, there's a lot to it a lot of different ways to use it different techniques are used with different things and it's all about just finding more and more dimensions of a person do you think that people you know, back in the time period when they were using this more comprehensive system you've just described, what would that be a couple thousand or more years ago? It was probably last used somewhere around 900 BC and it, it probably started fading out. I think that when Alexander the Great entered India around 300 BC, I think that really was a game changer for the astrology. Um, and at that point, we start seeing a real big difference between the North Indian astrology and the South Indian astrology. In South India, they use techniques that you don't find anywhere else, you know, just totally radical techniques that, that have no resemblance at all to stuff they used in North India. Um, and we're talking whole new schools of astrology. You know, they still use the Zodiac, but everything else is different. So I kind of look at their Zodiacal astrology and the, I you know, and whether it's Greek, Persian, Western, Hindu, South Indian, North Indian, 
It's zodiacal astrology. I see this as one big school of astrology with thousands of, not thousands, but dozens of completely different schools within it for different purposes. But then we also have different types of astrology that are not zodiacal. Um, we have like Chinese astrology, which is a time-centered astrology. We have human design, which is an astrology based on the I Ching. That is a really powerful system. Yeah, I've had it done on me. Yeah, so there's many types of astrological systems. So I don't differentiate between Western astrology and Vedic. I throw all those into zodiacal astrology. If you're using a 12-fold division called the zodiac of 12 different symbols, to me, that's one system of astrology. And I'll use anything that works from any country on earth, you know? Yeah, I'm that way too. The question I was leading to, though, is do you feel, well, it's it's a double question. It seems to me, intuitively, that back then, before we had modern technology, that their expression of, depiction of, and description of came by way largely of spending a lot of time in relationship with the stars and, and, and paying attention to what happens to crops and to relationships. They didn't have televisions to watch, so they watched the stars a lot. And and then it and so you a couple of things come to my mind. I'm, I'm sort of saying, do you think that those concepts came by way of a combination of intuition? You know, people can have very different ranges of of perception. You know, I'm a very perceptive human being. I can see auras. I, I'm, I'm clairvoyant, clairaudient, clairsentient, and I've done a lot of work through spiritual development to have those abilities. So I can walk into a room and pick up energy coming out of the walls if I want to. But a lot of people think a guy like me is just bullshitting them. So I feel my intuition is is, is that there was people that were much more tuned to these subtle energies and begin to develop relationships and learn from them and record them where now it seems like we're so distracted that we're gadget oriented. And so instead of astrologers today that have relationships with the stars, they have intimate relationships with books about the stars. I'm just curious as to, also, it, I wouldn't doubt it at all if a lot of these ancient astrologers were using plant medicines like mushrooms and marijuana and other things to enhance their capacity to connect to these subtle energies. Um, I'm just curious as to your thoughts on whether we're losing something through the use of technology or whether we're gaining something or where does that fall out? Yeah, so as an astrologer, I technology to me is is um, a side effect. Okay, it's not the cause of anything. How we see it, how I see it, is that we have the galactic center. Okay, now the galactic center is you know the source of what they call the Big Bang. That's where all the energy is radiating out of the center of our personal galaxy, the Milky Way. Okay. That point's called Vishnu Navi, which is the navel of Vishnu. And in the Hindu mythology, that's the point where the universe was born out of, or our, where our solar system was born, ultimately born out of. And in the center of that sits Brahma, the creator who created the whole galaxy. Okay, That's the most concentrated point of energy in our galaxy. The energy is so concentrated there that it has been sucking mass in from north and south with such velocity that it tosses the matter out sideways as the Milky Way. And imagine it's sucking it in so fast and hard that it can't even catch it, can't even hold it. It just gets shot out sideways and through this disk of the Milky Way. Yet, and the mass of that is just, the momentum of that is just causing the galaxy to expand. But at some point, it's slowing down, it's going to stop expanding, and it's all going to get sucked back into that center. So one of those expansions and contractions is called um, a day of Brahma. That's one day of the creator. Okay. Yeah, that's a very long, because I've studied these cycles. We're talking long. billions of years. Yeah, it's, it's like 479 billion years or something, because they're in self-realization fellowship. And this is the, the yugas, right? 
Yes, this has to do with the yugas. Okay, so now this is happening. But the point I'm making, this galactic center is the point of densest energy, which means it's the point of greatest energy, which is greatest concentration, which is greatest intelligence. So when our solar system is closest to that center, our consciousness on Earth on a collective level is higher and people live longer. When our solar system is furthest away from that, then our consciousness, the collective consciousness of Earth is at its lowest. Where are we now? <laughs> so right now, there's basically, the Hindus broke it into four phases for a basic understanding. We were, at, we were the furthest away around 400 AD. So that means that was the dumbest we got. We've been progressing since then slowly. Okay. So that's the dark age, darkest of the dark age. Now we've been progressing very slowly. So, and there's this dark age is the material age. And then the material age, the collective consciousness understands that the, the smallest real thing is the atom. And that's what the Greeks said, right? When you break something down to its smallest component, what you get is the smallest part of that thing. And that thing is called the atom. That's the material age. In that age, everything is about the physical realities of life. Physical food, physical beings. Men are more important than women because men can carry more and can hit harder. Okay, then we go into the next age, which is the atomic age. And that's when we break the atom. And we go, wait a minute, there's electricity. There's, there's stuff going on in this little particle. There's a whole fucking world yeah. inside this atom, right? Yeah. And this is the electric age, the atomic age. Now, in this age, we're going inside. So this is the age of psychology where we're going inside. This is the age where women are going to run the show. This is the age where women are more important to the health of society than men. So are we coming into that now or where are we? in? We've that been regard? in this. We've been in this since the 1800s. So about when quantum physics began. Exactly. When all this started, you can say when Ben Franklin tied a friggin key, key to a to kite. A kite yep. That's, I like to use that example because everyone knows that story. OK, since about then we were in that. But we started transitioning into that during the Renaissance. And that's why we had the Renaissance. The Renaissance was the tra transition out of the Dark Ages into the age of science, the age of looking below the surface. And um, and all, you know, Tarot made great advances during that time. Palmistry made great advances. All the occult science started to make advances there. Medicine did. Hanuman developed homeopathy, which was energy medicine, not physical medicine, but energy. This is the energy age. And he's developed that in the late 1700s. You could say when Uranus was discovered, we're going now, we're discovering invisible planets. We're looking inside the things. Okay? Yes. That was late 1700s too. Democracy became important, you know. Um, that was the birth of democracy with the French Revolution, um, the birth of America. This is the beginning, you can say, of this electrical age. Now, we're just in the very beginning of this. We don't even have an idea. We're still like, we're like, we're not even in kindergarten yet, you know, with what we're going to do. I have a, a question in that regard, because in my deep, spiritual investigations as to the transition between no thing and something, which I've done a lot of, not not just through reading and studying, but in my own spiritual investigations, I find it all emerges from a point, like a geometrical or mathematical point, which is smaller than any subatomic particle can get it you know 10 to the minus 34 is where the Planck constant is at but it, you know in my studies of quantum physics the, the physicists say if you have enough energy that you can actually take any subatomic particle and just keeping it breaking it down almost infinitely but what i find is that it all emerges from a point and that point is you know, the analogy I give in my new book, it's what happens when Shakti looks into herself and finds Shiva. It begins, all creation begins from that point of awareness. 
So my question is, what age would that concept fit into? Okay. So, yes, everything comes from that concentrated point of most dense energy. And that's why in our solar system, the galactic center is the most concentrated point relevant to our world. That's why the greatest intelligence is there. That's where you, where the most concentrated point is where you find God, right? Yeah. He's not found out there. He's found in that point that you mentioned. Okay. So, okay. The next age is the magnetic age. That will start in about 2,200 years. Wow. We got a ways to go. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> Let's <the> hurry magnetic- up. <laughs> Exactly. So you see, we're we're like we're like chimpanzees, you know. <laughs> exactly. Still. So we've got 2,200 years of developing as an atomic culture. We have 22 years to develop as a psychological culture. We have 22 years for women to 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 make the differences they're going to make in this age because this is a feminine age now. This is not a masculine age anymore. You mean 2,200, right? Um, we're at like. No, we're talking 2,200 years. Yeah, no, we're you said 4,200. You said 22. So I didn't know if you meant actually 22 years or if you were meaning 2,200. I mean 2,200 years. Yeah. <laughs> Long ways away. So we're only really just coming into it now. But when you look at the kind of stuff that they're doing with you know, secret space programs, I mean, I study Dr. Stephen, Stephen Greer's work. And you see that he says by the by about the year 1950, we'd already had spacecraft that we could fly, but pe- that you know they keep it very secret because they don't want pe- the people to know what they're doing. But we're dealing with already with anti gravity and and things that we are- think we are. We think we are, but I'm gonna put it into perspective for you. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah. So we have this timeline of about 400 AD, where everything before 400 AD was a declining culture, declining intelligence. From 400 AD, we started ascending. Okay, now, the pyramids were built in the electrical age, in the descending electrical age. Can they build the pyramids yet? No. See, they built the pyramids with electrical age technology. So, see, we think we're doing all this cool shit. Yeah, we still cannot move a big rock as big as they used to move. Exactly. And there's many instances of these. Pyramids is the most well-known, but there are so many things out there that the ancients did that we can't do, even with our amazing technology. Yeah. Yeah, We're good at destroying things, but not building anything that lasts very long. And and the problem we have now, we're using energy technologies Everything we're using is an energy technology now. It's not a physical technology anymore. It's energy technology. We're using all these technologies with bad side effects. We're using cell phones with radiation. You know, we're using God knows what. We're we're like kids playing with 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 forks and knives. Babies with forks and knives here, and we'll survive. We'll get cut. We'll get hurt. We'll hopefully survive. And learn how to play with energy in the way the Egyptians did when they built the pyramid. And we're going to be doing completely different things because nothing we're doing now is sustainable. No, that's the problem. All this stuff we call technology, by the time we get done with this age, it's not even going to exist. It's going to be a complete, it's going to be wiped off the face of the earth because of electrical technologies, energy technologies that are safe. Because none of the technologies we're using are sustainable. I'm interesting to hear. Have you ever studied the Law of One by Ra? I've read bits and pieces of it. Uh huh. Because one, I I found a lot of truth in that series. I've got the whole five volume set, and uh, I've been through it um, a lot. And I also have listened to the audio books to review it again. That they have, I think they have up to part two now, if I remember right. But Ra says that the Egyptian pyramids were not built like we think they are, that they are energy, highly energized thought forms, that they don't actually go build pyramids. And I talked to uh, Freddie Silva about this in a podcast I did with him. And he said, well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because he said, I've actually been in the um, 
vicinity of the pyramids and spoken to the old people that have been around there for their whole life. And they actually tell stories that their ancestors told them where they said they woke up one morning and all of a sudden the pyramids were there. They did not have any history of them being built like we would build a building. They literally woke up and said, what the hell is that? Hmm. And so my point in bringing that up is it goes even beyond electric technology, unless you want to think of thought as an electrical mechanism. And having studied thought forms and people like Ledbetter and others, I think that there's uh, a lot of validity to the fact, because if you have enough consciousness, you can actually use thought to materialize things the way you can use thought to bend a spoon. You know, there's an example of the power of consciousness over matter. So I, I, the reason I bring that up is because they may actually have been even be using even more advanced than electrical technology. Well, I still see that as electrical technology. So imagine, um, see, we're using, electric, we're using electricity, let's use communication. We're using electrical technology to communicate. We have our cell phone. It creates a frequency, it creates a wave. It creates a wave, passes this wave to another device, and that device picks it up. So we're using energy. We've created a medium of energy to talk on our cell phones. Before this, we used phone lines. We had a metal line, and we created a medium of electricity that flowed through the phone line to communicate. It was physical, it had a physical carrier, but it was an electrical impulse that went through the metal, metal copper lines, right? Yes. So now we've gotten rid of the copper lines and we're generating our own waves that pass through the sky and the air. But see, the thing is, there's already electricities right here and right now. Everywhere, yeah. So see, we're bathed in energy, but we haven't been able to tap into that energy and use it. We're creating our own unique energy forms to go through and reach the other person's cell phone, right? Yes. But why? Uh, one day, my theory is the energy that's already pervading around us, we will actually tap into that energy to communicate with. So we won't have to create a technology that has a frequency that causes us to have cancer because we have our phone in our pockets all the time, you know? I think we already have the technology. It's called ESP. It's called Psy. <laughs> and, you know, I'm right here on my desk, I probably have 10 books by hardcore researchers like Dean Radin and many others showing that the odds of uh, against chance are over a trillion to one that Psy is real, meaning you'd have to run a trillion experiments to prove them wrong based on the objective studies that they've been doing for many, many years. And so, you know, I, I, I personally think that we're actually slowly becoming awake to the advanced technology within ourselves. Exactly. As opposed to trying to keep building shit outside of ourselves. Because look, if you study the Aboriginal culture, there's lots of talk about song lines. And I've got a great book called Voices of the First Day by Robert Lawler. And I've studied many books on this. There's no question the aboriginals could be hundreds of miles away and they knew where the energy grids of the earth, Hartman lines and other lines like that is what we would call them today, but they would actually just focus on sending a message to somebody hundreds of miles away and say, I'll meet you at such and such a mountain. And sure enough, they would be there waiting for them. But those are non-invasive uses of energy. Richard Feynman, for example, calculated that there's enough energy in one square centimeter of empty space to boil all the oceans of this planet instantly, and that there's more energy in one cubic centimeter of empty space than all the matter in the known universe. So, you know, I'm, I'm concurring that, yes, there's a just, you know, the intensity of the energy. We're just so used to it because we're like fish in an ocean and we don't even know we're in water. But, but eventually we have to wake up. So it, 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 if we take this back to astrology, it seems to me that the constellations are somehow like um, mediators, transformers, manifolds, or um, almost like when you shine light through a prism, you get seven colors. So it seems like these 12 constellations are somehow 
modifying energy that affects our psyche. Would that be a, a way to look yeah. at it? Well, how you could look at it is that um, the basically what the constellation is, we have the earth and the energy is impacting the earth for, at, let's say, a different angle, depending where the planet is in the sky. So that would make it a local, not a non-local energy if there's an angle involved. Because the primary energy is that of the sun. So imagine the sun. This is what the sun's doing. It's putting out all this light. It's beaming its light down to earth. At different times of the year, it's beaming its light directly sideways at the earth. At other times, it's coming down at Earth. At other times, it's coming up at Earth. So it's actually radiating its energy in towards Earth in a completely different way. And that's like your chakras. Your energy, where's the energy in your chakras? The sun going around the zodiac is a replica of the energy going up around your chakras. Like through the microcosmic orbit, or what specifically do you mean? So actually, every year that the sun revolves around the sky, the solar energy in your spine has made one revolution. Okay, so if, you, if you're if you looking at the- And that evolves you. That evolves you, you said? Yes. So uh, just so I'm clear, when you're saying that the sun's energy is moving through the chakras, how, are you talking about as though the microcosmic orbit was like the equator of the earth? Basically, you've got our chakras. Let, let, let me back up a second, okay? How does, why does astrology work? How does it work? I see astrology working exactly as reflexology. By reflexology, you say, this is my foot. I make my foot look like my body. If I push this part of my foot, I'll treat this organ. It's called homo hetero theory. I met the, the most successful reflexologist of all time was Jay Park Wu. And he developed it to a degree of treating brain tumors. Interesting. And he used the hands a lot, feet a lot. And I really recommend anyone into it to find any J. Park Wu book you can find. J. Park. Park Wu. He's passed. His books are very expensive, but he's, I met him in India, spent some time with him. He's, he's one of the epic geniuses I've met on this earth. That sounds great. I'll look into it. Yeah. And so um, the idea is that there's always the bigger and the smaller. Okay. And there's always something closer to God and further from God. There's always something closer to the center and further away from the center. Okay. And if something looks like something else, what happens to it affects the thing it looks like. Like attracts like. So if the zodiac looks like our chakras, which it does, then what's happening around in the zodiac is happening within our chakras. It's almost like a holographic concept. Yeah, you can call it that. Okay. So we have the sun beaming its light literally in diff from different parts of the sky, which means different of our scent, our chakras are getting energized depending where the sun is. So if a person has the sun in Aries, I know that the, the chak, the energy in their hara is energized more than any other center. Okay. There is an actual relationship. Now, then what the sun's doing. It's beaming all that light onto Earth, but it's also beaming its light onto the planet. And the planets are little mirrors. The light hits the planet, and then the planet reflects that sunlight onto Earth. So you mean the other planets in the solar system? In the solar system, okay? Now, Jupiter has its own light. So if the sun went out, we could still see Jupiter barely. It has its own light, okay? The reason is because Jupiter has a similar composition as a star would. It's just not big enough to have turned into a star. Okay, But the other planets, it's all about the reflection of the sun's light, especially the moon, which is the biggest mirror, right? Yes. But all the planets are mirrors. So imagine the sunlight. But So all the energy we're really getting on an astrological level, the majority of it, as I mentioned, is sunlight. It's either direct sunlight or it's reflected sunlight off the planet. So each of the planets, you can say like a prism with seven colors. You can call it that. You can call it a prism, but it's actually a mirror. And it's reflecting this light differently depending on what the mirrored surface is. So like Venus, if you look, watch Venus with the telescope, you'll see that its mirror 
It's just like the moon. It's super white, super bright, and it even has a crescent shape at certain times. So the Venus is not always round when you look at it through a telescope. It'll get a crescent just like the moon. It'll be 50-50 huh. just like the moon. So that, that gives us a clue that there's a lot of similarities between moon and Venus. And when we study astrology, we see that they like to pair up sometimes in certain techniques. So, and in our palmistry, this line, the headline and the heart line are the, what they call the bundle lines, the lines of your connections, the things, the people you're tied to. One of them is the Venus line. The other one is the moon line. Okay. And those are two of the critical lines in our palm. And both of those planets make us make commitments to people or to make a family ties with people, which is what those lines represent in ancient Indian palmistry. So we just see that, wow, the fact that the moon, Venus is like a similar reflector to the moon, actually. Mars reflects a certain type of light. The, and, you know, they all reflect light in a certain way. So the moon, it reflects light. But as it's reflecting the light, it's also making really big north-south motions as it travels through the sky. So it's bouncing around. It's always changing its mind, going up and down. So we know the moon is what makes us change our minds, adapt, go up and down with things, and vacillate. That's you know, the tides. And things out and go through this race. It's the tides. And it, the very, it, the, it's a mirror that literally moves down through the zodiac like this, you know? Yeah. And then there's Mars. He goes like this, super slow, and then he super speeds up, and then he super speeds up backwards. In two years, Mars goes around the zodiac. But in six months, in one six-month period, every two years, he's only in a very small portion of space. He spends 25% of his time in one focused part of space when he goes forward, retrograde, and forward again. And so, and that's what Mars does. He's superficial about most things, and he gets to something that really matters, and he zooms in there. He takes care of it. He's efficient. He's effective. He gets the job done, and then he goes meandering away, and that's what Mars does in our chart. So the very if we study the planets simply as mirrors, we start getting the basics of the symbolism of them. Jupiter has this big eye, right? Jupiter is our spiritual development, which is all about the third eye, right? And Jupiter has this big cyclops mirror, you know, this big third eye mirror, basically. Yeah. So there's a lot of relationships to it. Jupiter's an orange mirror with white. Like if we take those colors into symbology, white is the color of spirituality and perfection. And it's the one light. It's the light of God. It's the light of purity. The orange light is the, the orange color is the light of fall. It's the color of fall. That's why swamis in India wear orange. The idea is my I'm gonna, I, I'm, my physical body doesn't matter to me. It's the energy in my body. The same way that in the fall, the leaf on the tree turns orange as it dies. It's like death to the body, death to the ego. But the energy in the leaf returns to the tree, returns to its God. And that's why they wear orange in the Swami tradition. Jupiter's the colors of, of um, it reflects the color of fall, of the leaf returning its energy to its source. And purity. And that's why Jupiter's a spiritual planet. That's very interesting. Mars is red. Mars is red. He's battered. Um, and he's, of course, the planet of war, of blood and war and aggression. I wanted to hear about Mars because of that very reason. So I'm glad you brought that up. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show as much as I am. I love my guests and I love you enough to tell you about Symbiotica's new amazing product called NMN. And in fact, it's so new, I don't really know much about it. So I said, Sherveen, I need to get you in here and tell me about this product so I know how to use it. So you get to sit in right now as Sherveen tells me about this amazing new product. Sherveen, why should we be taking NMN? So NMN stands for nicotinamide mononucleotide, and it's the main precursor to NAD, which we find in every cell, and it's what helps charge up the mitochondria in the body. It's used for every aspect of our entire life. Yes. Vision, mitochondria. sleeping, mitochondria, which is the true wealth. Energy it's Source. It's our energy storage. So we were able to source pure NMN and we have a whopping 400 milligrams per serving in there and typical Symbiotica style. We wanted to make this into a complex 
First off, it's a delayed release, number one. So the capsules are delayed release. We have apigenin in there, which is from chamomile, which is a powerful antioxidant. Green tea extract, L-theanine. Resveratrol in the trans-resveratrol form, which there's a lot of science that shows that there's a synergy between those two compounds, NMN and resveratrol. We also have coffee bean extract in there. This right here, you know, you want to get on top of your aging. You want to mm. start slowering cellular aging. Mm -hmm. We know now that we have a chronological age, yes. but we also have a biological age. Yes, absolutely. One person who's 50 could really be 35 biologically yeah. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. This is a very powerful way to slow down the aging process and in fact, possibly even reverse it to some people. I take it every day on the rise. It's energy. It's cellular energy. You can feel it. Everyone's you know coming out with their testimonials saying, wow, they've never felt energy like this. They've stopped drinking coffee and wow. using stimulants. It's powerful stuff, man. So if I enjoy my coffee, is it going to make me want to stop? No, it'll actually balance your coffee. I probably won't need as much. <laughs> probably not. Fortunately for my only do one shot a day, that's my absolute limit. So it's great to know that there's a product out there. For, particularly, I love the concept of, of a natural stimulation for the mitochondria because a lot of people, you know, the number one reason for physician visits worldwide is fatigue. Absolutely. Chronic fatigue stress, which could be thousands of things. Yes. And it's probably just an overrun immune system and cellular de-integrity. Yeah. And a lack of just nutritional variety and, and quality nutrition, which is what I love about all your products are all organic and they come from healthy soils and they're all formulated extremely well. And uh, I use them all and I love them. And I'm excited to try this one because at 60 years of age, I could use a little mitochondrial boost so I can keep up with my kids and my dogs. We're going to get you to about 28, 29 years young yeah. after a couple of rounds of this. Cool. Well, I'm already there biologically, so you <laughs> got to get right. me even younger than that. Okay. We'll go for 18. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, there you go. If you want your... NMN and some anti-aging and an energy boost and some uh, several other health benefits, give it a try. You can't do anything but get younger and feel better. So go to symbiotica.com, C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. And as a Living 4D listener and partner in making the world a better place, I've arranged for you to have a 15% discount on NM, excuse me, NMN, little tongue twister there, That's right. NMN. And you can use that 15% discount on any of Symbiotica's amazing products. The formula will help you pronounce it a lot better too. Oh, good. Well, that's, yeah. that's the sign I needed. <laughs> if you can't say NMN three times quickly, you need the product. I think we're all stuck with M&Ms. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Love you. Enjoy the product. Symbiotica.com. Check 15 on checkout. Enjoy your youth. When you're ready, I have a couple of questions as well. Sure, go ahead. Well, two of them. One, a mirror always causes a reversal. So what's the effect of the sun's light bouncing off the moon or any of these planets? Because it's going to cause a reversal of the light. So is that affecting consciousness in itself? Um, yeah, I think it does in a sense because the only real thing is the sun. The sun is... God in astrology. It's the soul of the whole universe in astrology. Okay. And in your own chart, it's your soul. So yeah, all the other planets are kind of giving us an upside down reverse view of the rally of our soul. They're, all the planets are really what get us caught in ignorance, get us all confused about our true identity. They're the planets that make us believe that we are this body and all this thing. And it, there's some called Shankya Yoga. Um, and you had talked to me about this logos, you know, this idea. That yes, there's this, that was one of my questions because. Yeah, there's this natural way that the world has been created, basically a logical structure to that. Well, the Hindus have their version of that called Shankya Yoga. OK, now the idea of this is that we have consciousness, which is energy. And there's two aspects of this consciousness. One is called buddhi which is the intelligence that's attracted to God. Love, yeah. To the truth. It's attracted to the truth. And then there's manas, which is the mind. And it's the mind, the sense mind, that the senses go into and create this illusion of the world we're in. And that would be maya, wouldn't it? The, the reversal of yeah, the light? Yeah, exactly. So the manas is, the moon in astrology is manas. It's the sense mind. It's the mind that all the senses are plugged into. The sun is the intelligent mind that wants the truth. 
Okay, it's the part of us that's questing for truth, searching for God ultimately. Okay, so there's two forces. The sunlight wants to take us, the sun wants to take us towards the source. The moon is pulling us away from the source by our, our, our energy going into our body, into our senses. The other five planets, Saturn, Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, and Mars, those are the five elements, which according to Shankya philosophy, give us the organs of knowledge, the sense, the ability to sense things, and also which give us the objects of the senses as a result, which is an illusion of a physical reality that doesn't even exist, you know? And so the mirror planets, the moon is the big mirror. You bet. It's reversing that light of the sun and flipping it around and putting the light right into the creation. A creation that doesn't even exist, you know? Yeah, there's the hologram again. Mm -hmm. I, I came up with a, sometimes my soul quite often actually gives me little one-liners or snippets of information. And uh, I often am inquiring about the nature of God because that's the thing that has had me most since I was a child. And it's kind of driven my constant research on every level. And I was in meditation asking for definitions of what God is. And I had been spending a lot of time studying the holographic universe principle. And my soul said to me, God is a hollow gram. And the meaning was the gram, the material gram is actually hollow. And hollow meaning hallowed or holy. And the gram being the illusion. And that's why it's all hollow. So the truth is, the material world is more like a reflection and therefore the hologram is the hologram, but it's really a, um, a projection in light. But in actuality, it's no more real than a, a, a television image is real, but it's exactly. the only way that God can experience itself because as unconditional love, there is no conditions. There's nothing to condition. So, I said to my soul, well, if God is unconditional love, then how did all this get here? Because that requires conditions. And so my soul said, God creates conditions so that it can love itself unconditionally. And that, to me, made a hell of a lot of sense. And you're describing the conditions, which is the maya and the manas and the body and all the things that we do that gives us the illusion of individuality so that we can exchange love and relationship, which ultimately, as we go deeper and deeper, leads us back to source. Yeah. And this is all indicated just astrologically as the sunlight is just reflected by all these mirrors. They're just, just all these things are just a reflection. All of our individualities are just reflections of the divine, which in astrology is the sun. Yes. So here's another question. I'm having a great time because you're answering a lot of questions that I've really wanted to get answers to for a hell of a long time. But because I don't have time to study astrology with enough focus and depth to really get to this, and I know a lot of other people have these questions too, and part of the reason I wanted to talk to you is because I wanted to try to demystify astrology because I think in a time like this when the world's going through a lot of transition, people start you know, reaching into esoterics. And the other thing they do is they go back into, they revert back in their consciousness. So they start going back into dogmas. And you see people now getting all into the end of days philosophy and reading passages out of the Bible, like they're literal facts. And so I thought, you know, this is an important time in, in all of our lives right now, where we got to be aware that going backwards takes us toward the dark ages, because 2000 years ago, when the Bible was supposedly written, wasn't a very bright age. And, and now, you know, relying on astrologers that may not be as skilled as we need them to be to trust the guidance or going outside for advice when we should be going inside of ourselves, which again is a path that takes a fair bit of time to develop. So you know, what I'm saying is I'm very grateful to hear these things. And I trust you because I know you've spent your whole life investigating things just like I have spent my life investigating things. One of the questions I had is, 
and, and this is an interesting one. I'm quite confident you'll have a good answer for it. I, I've been working with my soul directly for a very long time. Uh, what happened to me was I've probably studied over 120 books on the soul. I literally, I just felt that the soul was such an important concept that I had to really understand it, but it would drive me absolutely fucking bonkers because I can put 10, 20, 100 books on the table and all these experts on the soul, are, they don't agree with each other. And, and I've only got two books that I've ever been able to find that teach you anything about how to communicate with your soul. So they're all talking about this mystical thing and say, oh, you got to trust your soul. But yeah, nobody tells you how to freaking communicate with the damn thing. So I just went into meditation probably, I don't know, 18 years ago. And I just sat in meditation and said, if a soul is real, then it has to be what's conscious in me or what's the point of having a soul. So I just went silent and said, dear soul, if you are here and you are real, I need you to give me some indication that you're there. And within a second, my body's energy just flowed up through like a volcano right out the top of my head. And it shocked me. It was like someone turned on all my meridians full force. And I went, holy shit. I said, dear soul, if you just did that, do that three times in a row. And sure enough, one, two, three. So I said, ah, you are there. And the truth is, I wouldn't even know how to do that to myself. Like, because people have said to me, well, how do you know you weren't faking? And I said, okay, good. I want you to create a volcano of energy that flows up through your spine right out the top of your head all at once. Nobody can do that unless they're a very advanced yogi. So then I said to my soul, show me what it feels like when you're saying no. And I felt all my energy implode and it felt like someone was telling me a lie. And so I used that basic language to begin answering questions just like you would with dousing where you have to have a yes or no. You can't say what color is somebody's hair, but you can have a color wheel of uh, colors and say, you know, what's the color of my child's hair going to be? And the pendulum will swing toward brown, let's say. But over time, what happened is I began get. I asked my soul to give me vision, so my soul then started communicating to me with movie-like images. And then I learned to listen to my soul, where I go real quiet and empty my own mind, and my soul then talks to me. But again, you have to be very quiet and centered because that voice is so subtle that it, it's it's kind of like listening to somebody talking to you in the background. So you have to really quiet yourself or you can't hear it. And if, you're, if your ego's working, you're doing your own thinking, it's like 10 times the volume. So it takes a lot of practice to get still enough inside to have these direct communications. So the question is, through all these years, I've found that there's periods where it seems like my soul is sluggish, almost like it's sleepy. But then there's other times where it's the communication's very fast and very direct. So here's the question. Can that change in the nature of the soul's capacity to communicate and interact somehow be affected by the astrological influences? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the ultimately, as a background to answering your question, so in astrology, the sun is the soul. Okay? The sun is also the body. So the soul is in the body. It's not in the mind. And our job is to bring the awareness of that soul, which is in the body, into our consciousness. And that's what happened when the energy of the body rises into our brain, then we have an experience of our soul, which is what you're talking about here. Okay. So yoga practice is all about bringing the energy that's in the body up into the brain where we can realize that energy as our soul, as God, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So the sun you know, the energy is in the sun, the energy is in the body, the soul's in the sun, the soul's in the body. But different times, different things are happening. And then we have all of our other planets. All of our other planets are reflecting the light of that sun. 
So they can give us a vision of God. They can give us a vision of our soul. But they're not going to all do it equally simply because of the condition they're in. When a planet's in a good condition, it lets us be in touch with our soul, which is in our body. It lets us listen to our inner voice. It lets us make good decisions. When a planet is in a bad condition, we don't know how to work with that planet. We don't know how to listen to that planet's inner guidance. And so then we go into our brain. Then we go into the mental world. And when we're, when we're, when we're in the mental world and we're trying to make decisions mentally, you're trying to figure out our lives mentally, we can't get anywhere. We're spinning our wheels. And so these planets will do that. And so as we go through life, different planets are constantly coming up and we're living on the energy of those planets more. And so when we look, when we go into a period of a planet that is struggling more with experiencing that reflection because its energy is you know, distorted, basically, yeah, it's going to be really hard. And then other times, it just comes right through. So it depends what planet is a primary influencer on you at any given time. Yeah, so th- the way I have to circumvent that is I have to get which kind of has an interesting effect because when you have as much experience communicating with your soul as I do, and you can sense these differences, the only way I can circumvent that is I have to get even more still. I have to really, and I notice, like, for example, if I get tired from working too much or getting involved in the world too much and I run myself too hard, that I, it's harder and harder for me to get soul guidance. So I've learned that when I feel that, what I call season of the soul, it's just the words I came up with because it seems like it's seasonal. That's when I I have to, to manage myself more carefully or I'm, like you said, left to my mental guidance, which is when you look at the ego, it's largely other people's ideas that we've just imprinted into our own memory banks so we're actually running on old news all the time and we're almost always running on somebody else's ideas about whether you should or shouldn't get married or should or shouldn't buy this house or whatever so it becomes quite tricky so what it did to me was it made me realize okay my connection with my soul isn't as strong right now so i've got to really put a little more time into my morning practice to center myself and be more conscious of of how I manage all the aspects of my life or I lose touch with my guidance system. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. It's more of a struggle. And another thing that we can do to help with that is that the reason we go to the mind instead of going to our souls for information is because the planet that's causing that is attached to some old psychological wounds. You know, it's taught, it's caused to issues. It's basically drawn to issues of inability, um, you know, uh, unableness, lack of self love. About it's the planet that's indicating a, a poor relationship with ourselves. It's basically that psychologically struggling planet. And so, if we heal our psyches and we spend time, you know, healing our wounds, um, then we can. Um, get into a state of being centered more readily. Once, once those wounds are healed, it's easy to be centered. When we're struggling with the wound, we get uncentered and we go to our brains and we make mistakes and we can't know what to do. And like you said, we're running off old news. And the ironic thing about running off other people's ideas is they're telling their ideas about things that they didn't make work either. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they're just passing their wounds on to us. <laughs> they're just passing their wounded information on to us. So... <laughs> There's a great book I really like. I think a lot of your users, I think you would really enjoy. It's called, um, uh, it's by Lise Bourbeau, Bourbeau, and it's, um, I think it's Healing Your Wounds and Finding Your True Self. What's really great about this book, she broke the wounds down into like five categories. We're judging, looking at a person's bodily we can actually pick out their wounds. And so a person can look at their body and say, oh, this is the psychology stuff I have to work on. And um, so especially if you're working with people and seeing their bodies, in an instant you'll go, oh yeah, this person's issue is this. Yeah, I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> yeah. And, and and so that's a book a lot of your you know people, and I think you might enjoy. I, I'll um, get it for Healing sure. Your Wounds and Finding Your True Self by Lise Bourbon. How do you spell the and name? It's on Amazon. 
Uh, let me find it so I can tell. Um, let me just take a minute to double check that it's going to come up that way on Amazon. Yeah, okay, because I, I, I collect all sorts. I've studied countless books like that. It's a really short book. That's what I like about it. You can bust through it in a few hours. But see, as you read about it, whatever your wound is, your ego doesn't want you to know. It wants to hide it. And it wants to blame our pain on that wound. So there, there's a lot of intricities to it, but we're going to do our best not to see it. So when we first read the book, you're going to say, oh, this is my wound. It'll be an issue that you're okay with living with. Uh, but when you realize, oh, this is really my wound, I'm really this kind of asshole, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> it's like, you don't want to believe it. So you re- even though it's a short read, um, we need to read it at least, you need to really study this book deeply because it's, the ego wants to deceive us. It does not want us to know what our greatest I have a, greatest a very is. simple system for getting past all that. I just simply say to my soul, what is the part of this book that I need to read right now? It guides me right to it. And if I have questions, I always ask my soul. I, I do my very best to put my ego in the back seat because I'll tell you, the more I let my soul run my life, the better it gets, the smoother it gets. And I, I've, I, I could sit here for hours and tell you all the ways that that's true. In fact, I'm sitting here in the dream home on the dream property of my life that I never would have dreamed I could have made it to. But it was only through listening to my soul and healing my pains and past issues and fears about money and everything else that's, you know, everything that I teach other people, I do to myself first, or I just feel like I'm just another talking head and I get tired of all the talking heads. So I don't want to be one. So my way around all that is just totally let my soul, I let my soul tell me how much of foods to eat, what foods to eat, what clothes to wear, what colors to choose. I tell people, look, you better make sure that you start practicing with your soul on things that do not matter to your ego. Like, who cares whether you're wearing black or white underwear? Your ego doesn't give a shit because no one sees your underwear. So I work and teach my students work constantly with insignificant things. Like, how much water should I drink right now? Should I take two B vitamins or three or four or none? Because if you don't work at that level and develop a deep connection, I say you've got to learn your soul's energy signature because the ego has a very different vibration. And whenever my students are getting in trouble, like I'll give you a good example. One of my students came to me and said, oh, I've been eating a box of um, Oreo cookies a day because my soul said that was okay. I said, I got news for you. Your soul would never tell you to do something that would be destructive to your body because that's the vehicle of its own experience. So your ego is getting in the way. And after this happened a few times, I went, okay, I've got to teach my students how to differentiate the voice of the ego from the voice of the soul. The problem is, is you have to commit yourself to the practice long enough to get sensitive enough to know the difference, or you won't get there. And as you know very well, very few people will do the work for real spiritual growth because they just, you know, the the ego hates spiritual growth because it means death to the ego. But the reality of it is, it's it's not about killing the ego. It's about bringing the ego into harmony with that which is a lot wiser and a lot more connected. And and, and the soul's in real time. The ego's always, like we said, using old news. Yeah, it's either in the past or living for a present, a future that hasn't happened. Yeah, no, it's really true what you say. And I like definitely practicing on the little things that don't matter. I think one of the first things I would practice on is the stupid things like what restaurant to pick. Exactly. You know? And then you learn, you you go and you find out, oh, I shouldn't have come here or I should have come. And you learn the feeling of it. So anyway, this author is Lise, L-I-S-E, for Bo, B-O-U-R-B-E-A-U. B-E-A-U, like boy, B Bo? Yeah, like yeah, like Bo. Okay, great. That, that I'll get that. Um, that's fantastic. All right, let's move on. Yeah, that that was good though. I mean, that was very very important. Um, my next question is kind of a simplistic one, but I think you'll give us a good answer. You know, a lot of people think astrology readings are like bubblegum readings or fortune cookie readings, and so they just ignore it. And then there's those that are so ardent to astrology that they end relationships and do all sorts of other stuff just because a reading said so, and, and that can be wrong too. So how do you, as an astrologer, guide people to how to find 
the middle path or how do how do you use an astrology reading in a productive way so that you don't get fanatical about it nor ignore it i think the most important thing for the person is just to go to the astrologer and just show up without any intentions uh -huh. and realize that you're you're going there to get something that you don't really know what it is yet um the worst thing I think people can do to go to an astrologer is get a list of 20 questions and say, okay, I want to know these 20 things. And they approach it from this mental thing. I want to know this. That's all mental games. That's all ego bullshit. You know, I, I won't even do readings for people who come with 20 questions um, or 10 specific questions. I don't deal with that stuff. I say, when you want a reading with me, you just show up and we see what happens, you know? Um, and cause you don't know, I, I had one woman, one girl, she came in, her parents had studied with me and they were really into astrology. They were talking about astrology at home all the time. She was like 17. They said, Oh, you got to get a reading. Finally, she came in. I do this reading. And I can't get anything from her chart. It's just like a dead, everything's flat. Everything's dead. I'm not making any progress. And I'm feeling, wow, I blew this reading for the girl. She gets, then she you know, she drops me the check that her parents had written out for her. Then she gets up and she kind of like gets off the seat and then she drops back down and she goes, how, how accurate is any of this? That's when she finally got interested, right? I said, I said, for you, astrology is not accurate at all. Because see this thing you have in your fifth house, this means astrology won't work for you. It's not your, where you're going to get your guidance system. You'll get your guidance system from a completely different, you know, you'll get guided, but not from astrology. She goes, I'm really glad to hear that because I've never been into astrology. My parents are so into it now. I feel like a weirdo living in my house and because I just can't buy into it. I don't feel like it's right for me. And I'm so glad to hear that it's not right for me. And that made the reading for her. You know? I think that's a beautiful reading, though. I mean, how much more honest could you get? How many astrologers would have been brave enough to say that? Yeah, I have some astrologers that you know, ask me how to look for that kind of stuff. Um, I have some students that when they see that in a person's chart, they won't read it. They just won't even try because every time they try, it turns into like it doesn't work. But um, sometimes that's what the person needs. So I think the most important thing is go to an astrologer because you want to, not because someone else says, you know, um, use, you know, listen to your soul. If your soul says go, you go. If your soul says don't go, don't go. I've had people been forced. I've had people come who are forced into it or pressurized into it. It's never a good experience. It's not what's supposed to happen. They're supposed to get their information another way that day. So don't listen to your mind. Don't decide what you want from the reading. Show up with your emotions. Show up with your problems, but drop the ideas. The worst thing you can do is go to an astrologer full of ideas, full of specifics. Just show up in the in the molten mass of pain or joy or whatever you are, you know, and just let the reading happen. I was just going to say, I think part of the reason that's so important is because people are using astrologers like surrogate mothers and fathers instead of actually developing an intimate relationship with their soul or their inner self or their own inner guidance system. They're always going to someone else to, to try to solve their problems. And unfortunately, I think the whole education system we've set up worldwide, especially with the academic structure, is it's trained people like religions train people only to listen to priests and higher ups. Then we have only listened to the professors. So what happens is is we've imprinted people with this model that you don't know anything compared to the guy that's got a bigger degree than you. So you shouldn't think for yourself because you, what do you know? You know, so I, I think we've kind of our education system has actually railroaded people from developing an intimate level of trust and self-exploration and, and just the willingness to explore life without a fixed mindset about what's supposed to happen. You know, I think and it's without kinda... that, our soul is out of the picture. One of my students really said it best. OK, um, she said, <laughs> um, if you, you know. What if okay? If somebody tells you what who you are and what to do, that's considered an abusive relationship. 
<laughs> That's so true. <laughs> so people come to the astrologer and they say, who am I? Tell me what to do. Yes. They want another you know, abuse. They go to the doctor. They say, what am I? What's wrong with me? Tell me what to do. You know, it's like everyone is saying, I want to be in an abusive relationship with my astrologer, with my priest, with my doctor, <laughs> with my guru. When the only thing any of those people should be do there is to show us things that our inner voice, our soul can say yes or no to. Now, what I've gone, the way I've gone with astrology the last few years, I back when you met me in the day, I was doing lots of predictions. I was predicting stuff to the day all the time. I never do that anymore. It's not worth my time and energy. It's hard friggin' work. I don't want to work that hard. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, you know, that's one reason. Also, I rarely see predictions help people. What I've, how I've started, what I'm doing now, and I'm mostly teaching it in course form, is I teach people the habits of the planet. To me, there's only one, there's only good habits and bad habits. There's only one good habit, and the good habit is listening to your inner voice. Everything else is a bad habit in my book. Being nice is a bad habit. Being nice when your soul says be nice is a good habit. Be mean when your soul says be mean is a good habit, okay? <laughs> so the way I say it's the only good habit is listening to your inner voice of your soul, listening to your inner guidance system. Everything else is a bad habit. Then I look at the planets and I see the planets that are working psychologically in a way where they can hear their inner voice. And then I look at the planets that are working in a psychological way that they don't hear their inner voice. And I talk about, I, I tell them about how that planet is sabotaging their ability to listen to their inner voice. I don't want anyone to follow anybody. I want people to listen to their inner voice because that's the only chance in hell we have for happiness as you have discovered and mentioned you know yeah nothing else will work and we were so full of shit telling us to not listen to the inner voice inner voice says do this you say no fucking way and ruin your life and 20 years later you got cancer you know yes and you know the other thing about listening to your soul is it it, it is not always easy i'll give you a real simple example <laughs> you know I part of my meditation practice is I lift stones and I build sculptures out of stone and it's very very dangerous. I mean if you I could send you some pictures but like I build 17 18 foot tall things with 300 pounds stones in them and I've been hurt very badly and almost <laughs> died a few times because these things come down, you know, and if you're not careful you're dead and I've bled like a son of a bitch and had knocked the shit out of myself, split my head open, smashed fingers, ripped feet, ankles, everything. When Penny's had to patch me up several times, but every single time something happened to me, it was because my ego got involved. But the point I'm driving at is I'll, I always, I just go in there and go empty and say to my soul, okay, what do you want to do today? What do you want to create? And sometimes my soul will guide me to, to some big ass stone. I mean, this thing's like 300 plus pounds and it needs to go at the fourth level. I'm like, okay, how am I going to get that damn stone at chest height when I can barely fucking roll the damn thing? And I'll say to my soul, you know, if I do that, I'm going to get hurt. You sure you want me to do that? And my soul says, yes. I said, how am I going to lift that stone that high? And my soul says, be creative. Who says you have to lift it that high? And so I then said to my soul, what am I going to do? And my soul says, how about putting a small stone on the ground and rolling it up on that and then getting a bigger stone and rolling it up onto that and build a set of stairs until it's right where you want it. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm so stupid. I shouldn't have just figured that out immediately with my mechanical mind. But the point I'm making is, your soul can tell you to get into a relationship that scares you, to get out of one that makes you comfortable, to lift something that's too heavy for you. I mean, I've found working with your soul is, is it's definitely not for the lighthearted because it'll push the barriers of your ego in every fucking way you can imagine. Yeah, but at the same time, it's the adventure we, we're all craving to go on. 
Absolutely. That's why I do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the further you go, the more I find, the more at peace I feel because I know I don't have to try to solve the problems of my life with my head or what most people would think of as alone. And when you realize that your soul is God experiencing itself as you, then you got the guidance of, of source itself. My next question I wanted to, to ask is, well, lots of them, but here's a concept that, that I've had in my mind. I want to know if it's accurate. Would you think that if we, if we said that the universe is to God, like our body is to us, could the planets and the stars, particularly in this context and the constellations, be like organs within the body of God that ultimately affect us like organs? Because just like your liver can be the source of anger if it's backed up, or your kidneys fear, or your heart love and grief, it seems to me like it's almost like these are living organs, they're not just bodies of balls of fire out there. Yeah. So just as in Chinese medicine, the organs are related to different um, elements, right? Yes. And those, the planets are the five elements, you know, not the sun and moon, but the other five visible planets, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, and Venus, and Saturn, those are the five elements. So, um, you know, we can look at all that with astrology, of course. And so that's all part of astrology as well. It does work along those same lines of the five elements. And the five elements, each element creates two organs. Um, that's why each, so each planet rules two signs of the zodiac. One is the yin organ, one is the yang organ. So yeah, all those correlations are there, you bet. And I, I have a course called Astrological Anatomy where I get into that. That's good. Well, see, I just... For years, I've been having this feeling because sometimes I'll just stand there and connect to the moon. And uh, several years ago, my soul directed me to being a vegetarian for a year and had me getting up every morning with the sunrise and doing sun gazing meditation for an hour and then an hour at night. And I had profound experiences interacting with the consciousness of the sun. And I got all sorts of guidance on how to heal people and just a myriad of things that I won't go into. Hi, everybody. I sure hope you're enjoying the podcast today. You know, it's said that most people are either in too much of a rush to prepare fresh organic greens, be they vegetables or green fruits like fresh green apples, and end up grazing on inferior foods. But it comes with a cost. Nutrient depletion, reduced capacity to handle stress, reduced immune resilience, and you age more rapidly. But Organifi comes to our aid again with an amazingly tasty, nutritious addition their new crispy apple green juice. But it's more than just another apple drink. It's packed with your favorite adaptogens and superfoods. Some key features of Organifi's new crisp apple green juice are delicious taste from organic crisp apples, organic whole apple sources hand-picked, including Golden Delicious from Washington, Northern Spy, Macintosh, Ida Red, and Empire from Ontario, Canada. The new crisp apple green juice is formulated with the highest quality ashwagandha at an effective dose of 600 milligrams for helping your body handle stress more effectively. And it's low sugar, only 2 grams per serving, but the taste is amazing for such a low sugar drink. Just add water, mix, and experience the joy of real food real fast. Go to Organifi.com, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, and save 20% on Organifi products when you enter your Living 4D discount code, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20 during checkout. That's check 20 for your 20% discount on Organifi products during checkout. Enjoy Organifi's new crisp apple green juice. The other question I wanted to ask you is, you know, I've studied the I Ching a fair bit and I've got some wildly good books on the I Ching by some really smart people. I'm curious, you know, the I Ching really seems to me to be very similar to astrology in that it's like a structure, like a prism that's doing different things with energy at different times as we move through the seasons or through the cycles. 
Could you talk a little bit about things like the I Ching or Stonehenge or even pyramids? Are there correlation between I Ching, for example, in astrology or correlations between pyramid star positions in astrology? Yeah, I think there definitely is. Um, so like with the I Ching, it's all based on a yin and yang line, right? So that's the sun and moon day and night, heaven and earth. It's all based on those same basic principles. And astrology, everything really is founded on the sun and the moon. Um, that's why they're the two biggest planets. They're, they both are the same size when we look at them up in the sky compared to the other planets, which are you know so tiny, people usually don't even notice them. Right. Right. So um, there is definitely a correlation to that. And of course, with the human design system, they've taken the I Ching and plotted it into the zodiac so the circle of the zodiac is not the zodiac in the in the human design system it's 64 hexagrams of the I Ching. so instead of having a you know 12 30 degree arcs it's 64 much smaller arcs and those those, those little arcs of the I Ching are very specific um they're in some ways more specific than a big zodiac sign because they're smaller right um so i really see the I Ching as um our energy potential. See, energy, the I Ching is the book of changes, as you know, I'm just saying for other people, right? So the idea of the I Ching is that things are always changing into other forms. Things change when a yin becomes extreme, it turns to yang. And when a yang becomes extreme, it turns to yin. So we have this I Ching with six lines, there, and the line's either a yin line or a yang line. And one of those lines is going to go to extreme, and then that I Ching is going to change into another hexagram, into another I Ching. So it's this I, I Ching is really this idea that, you know, the basic physics truth that energy is changes forms but never disappears. And it's all about change. So the I Ching is the, the change of form that energy takes. It can change from love to hate. It's still just energy. It's still conscious energy. It's still God. You know, it just went from and it went from experience of love to experience of hate. And so when we look at like the I Ching astrology, what's called the human design, we can see the energy potential of the person, meaning the state of their energetic body in this lifetime. And that makes um, and that essentially shows the potential. Energy is potential, as we know, in this world. Right. Like you can have a gun and it has the energy of a cartridge in it and we can release this energy in the cartridge for a devastating effect or for an altruistic effect, right? So it's not the gun that's good or bad. It's just energy and it has potential. All energy is like that. It has, it's just the potential within us. So I think the I Ching relates to astrology and really letting us get a really good view of our potential. You know, in the form it's, you know, done with casting the I Ching. I think it's a, a great system. Um, it does follow astrological principles like the lines. There are six lines. Those six lines relate to different planets, starting with the sun at the first line to Jupiter at the sixth line. So we can understand why things, why is the fifth line so important, the line that matters, because that's Mars. Mars is the planet we get out when something really matters. And then we, we ignore it. When it really matters, we get Mars, you know? Um, so there are a lot of correlations, but the beautiful thing about the I Ching is it's such a simple, profound system that a person can spend a lifetime on, especially if they want to really learn to read it on the level of the lines instead of a level of interpretations. It's a, it's a yin yang language. It's a, it's an energetic language, literally energetic language that I think, um, is really for any occultist, it's really worth exploring on an energetic level. Try to understand how the energy is communicating these hexagrams to have specific meanings. Yeah, you know, I had my human design reading done. And unfortunately, the only thing I remember is that I'm a manifesting generator. Okay. Yeah, so 70% of people are generators, um, you know, and... Manifesting generators um, are really not that much different than a typical generator, but when any a manifesting generator can plan things better, you uh -huh. know, <laughs> more successfully at planning things compared to typical generators who 
plans more often go astray. So it's better to constantly be in a state of response and letting the inner guidance system go. Manifesting generators uh, are more effective planners, but um, they're not fully effective, effective planners, just more effective planners, you know? Well, that's why I have a soul to figure, figure the rest out. <laughs> no, and see, the thing is, there's this idea, you know, we're taught, I think one of the big travesties of life, one of the things that's destroyed humanity and humans and beings and children, especially more than anything else, is this idea of you decide, you make it happen. What we're basically saying is you work in isolation. I mean, and people, they, they come to me and they, they I'm going to decide what's going to happen in my fate. I'm going to decide how my life's going to be. And I'm like, why would you want to do that all alone? Why do you want to decide? It's for me, the adventure is I'm going to get on that bike with God, I'm going to sit in the back seat and say, take me where you want me, baby, you know? Yeah, you're you're going into the Taoist or Zen principle of no mind. Yeah, it's like, why do we want to be the decider when we can let a God be the decider, be the divine or our soul, whatever you want to call it, be the one making the decisions? To me, that's much more of a romantic journey than this idea of you decide what you're going to be, you decide what you're going to do, and you make it happen. I say... God decides what I'm going to be. God decides what I'm going to do. And then I'll make it happen. You know, we still have to make it happen. But the decisions, leave that to someone who knows what's going on, you know? Well, yeah, it's like the Quakers say, pray and move your feet. Don't just expect God to do it all for you. You you know, you get the guidance, but you got to go do it or you're you're just. uh, And that's really what our brains are for. Our brains are here to figure out the way to do something. Once our inner voice, our you know, our soul has directed us towards doing that. So, um, yeah. So I don't know. So I don't know. I Ching's great. Um, I don't really see a need to relate it to astrology. It's such a great system. Um, it can be used superficially, really effectively, or a person can go into it like a crazy person, study it for sixty years, and and not know anything of what they want to learn. It's so vast. It's, it's so <laughs> profound. I was really uh, more speaking of the principles of how it works was what I was referring to. Like, so yeah, it does work along the same principles. The idea is that everything's ultimately happening in unity. There, there's no separation. So the That's idea the that. Why does astrology work? Because we're connected. There's no separation between the planets and us. Same reason. I, you can come to me with a question. I can cast a chart for the question. And based on that chart, I can answer the question. Or you can come and we can cast some cards. Or you can come and we can cast an I Ching. But basically the idea is at any moment, anything that happens is the same thing. So if you ask a question, I cast an I Ching. The I Ching is going to reflect your question because they're happening at the same moment. And the moment I cast the I Ching, the moment you ask the question, the astrology is going to reflect the same thing. And your birth chart is going to reflect the same thing and the astrology of the moment. So we're in this constant state of unity and connectedness. And that's the only reason any of these sciences work. The beautiful thing about astrology, though, we can see the omens because these are all ultimately omens. When we cast an I Ching, we're saying, let me, I'm going to cast an omen. Let's find out what the omens are. With astrology, we can see what the omens are going to be like in the future, right? Right. See, with, with the I Ching, if you ask me a question, if I, if, if I don't know what the I Ching is going to say in your life in 10 years, there's no way I can know. But I can look at your chart and I can see the omens of astrology in your life in 10 years. Whereas things like the I Ching and the cards are working, they're falling in reference to right now. And even if you ask a question and you say, well, I need to learn what I had a relationship 10 years ago and I need to learn something from it. We can cast the cards and the cards are going to show what you need to learn right now from that relationship, not what happened 10 years ago, you know? So there are omens of the moment. Astrology is an omen of the moment, but we can calculate the planets. We know where the omens are going to fall, whereas we don't know where the tarot cards are going to fall in an hour, you know, or even the next 10 seconds. Exactly. But astrology, we can, we can, we know where the astrological omens are going to be in 5,000 years. Yes. Because of the, (laughs) because of the uh, consistency of the orbits and everything. This next question, um, you may have already addressed it. Maybe not. I'll, I'll give it to you and then you can respond how you want. It's about archetypes. Um, 
What role do archetypes play in astrology? And the reason I ask is that Steiner states there's three archetypes that are involved in the whole cosmos, which are space, time, and movement. And, and Itzhak Bentov says without those three factors, you can't have consciousness. Um, so without these archetypes, space, time, and movement, there'd be no awareness of anything. And um, it's space, time, and movement that are essential to all astrological influences, which change moment to moment. Um, due to the astrological bodies moving, um, could you share your definition of an archetype and and maybe tell me from your perspective how they relate to astrology or is it a different concept? Yeah, well, um, astrology in itself, you could say, is those three primary archetypes of space, time, and movement because they're dealing with the celestial sphere of space. The sun and the moon create time. And Jupiter does too, believe it or not. And then they're all moving, right? And also the Earth is moving within that sphere and changing all the planets for everybody on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So astrology itself is all happening as that archetype. Then we also have like the different planets. So Venus, for instance, is the archetypical, archetypical woman. Jupiter is the archetypical um, teacher. So all the planets are archetypes of, um, of everything in our life, ultimately, you know. Um, the main thing is we don't really consider what an archetype really is. Like, for instance, Venus is an archetype of a vehicle. Okay, well, what, is, what does that mean? That means, yeah, it rules your car. But what Venus really is, the vehicle is what you use to get from point A to point B. So woman is an archetype of Venus and, um, and a relationship is an archetype, is the Venus archetype. A relationship is a vehicle to get from point A to point B. People don't recognize that and they think a relationship is an end all. And then they get involved in a relationship and have a codependent, unsatisfactory relationship. If they understood that relationship is an archetypical of Venus, an archetype of a vehicle, to understand its purpose is to get them from point A to point B, you know? Right. And that's why some relationships have a natural end point to them and you shouldn't fight it. Exactly. Because you got from point A to point B and you get out of the car. You don't drive to the mall and carry the car into the mall with you. No, not, <laughs> not, not if you're, and if you're strong enough to carry the car into the mall, you'd already be rich doing uh, stunts. Yeah. So so anyway, everything in astrology is an archetype of something. But as uh, respect to those three archetypes, um, and everything, planets, zodiac signs, they're all considered archetypical energies um, by astrologers. And um, But of course, in reference to those three primary archetypes, the whole body of astrology, the, is, the whole science of it embodies those three primary archetypes. Now, archetypes classically mean primordial ideas. Jung says they're empty forms. They, he says they don't uh, have any attraction to whether you're a good mother or a bad mother or whatever, but, but the, the, we, the archetypes give our psyche a means of understanding the concept. I, I say archetypes are the root language of consciousness, because if you didn't have archetypes, there's no way you'd be able to understand anything. You wouldn't know the difference between a mother and a rock. Um, how would you define an archetype? Yeah, I I consider like an archetype is like an emblem or a symbol of something. He points to something else. It just, it doesn't point to something out. It's just showing the essence of something, basically. Well, a symbol, by definition, is something that points beyond itself to something else is what I'm referring to. Yeah, it lets us see the the truth that's not so apparent, you know. The older word for symbols was emblem. Um, that was the word used more in the 1800s. They, they used this word em emblem, which is an interesting word. But um, I mean, I think all symbols are, are archetypes. Like, you know, like we could just take this idea of uh, a symbol of something falling, like a meteor. It's a, it's a symbol of a fall. So falling is an archetype. It's not good or bad. You can build one of your sculptures and a rock can fall on your head. We consider that bad. <laughs> or you can be walking down, you know, down the street in Hawaii and a mango falls in front of you. And you're like, perfect. I was feeling like a mango. 
Yeah. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So yeah. you see, this there's an archetype that, of this essence of this idea that things fall. Well, that can be for good or bad. And there's an archetype of energy rises. So I think as an astrologer, over time, I've really learned to kind of see everything as emblems or symbols or archetypes. And I'm also always looking at the unity of things and looking at what's happening. So if somebody comes up to me and asks me something or says something, I'm, I'm watching and looking for the essence of what they're asking. Because, you know, and you, you are constantly reading the omens, which are the archetypes. And, and we have to understand those only work if we read them on an archetypical level. We can't use that. We can't read astrology. We can't read um, omens as specific, detailed, concrete, immovable things. You know, it's just like it's like if we say, oh, a fall is a bad thing. We add a specific to it. Now we've destroyed the archetype of a fall. Yes. Now it's an idea, just a, an idea or a concept or. Yeah, it, it needs to be this broad right? idea that allows our consciousness to tap into the reality of the situation that the symbol, the emblem, the archetype is trying to show us. Yes. Yeah, th that's in line with how I work and perceive archetypes. I've studied them quite a lot. But, you know, again, you study 10 books on archetypes and you'll get a lot of different opinions. So I put most of my trust in Jung because basically he was him and Steiner are two of the people that I've studied on archetypes that really exemplified to the world their the depth of their consciousness through their own life. I'm always asking the question, does this author live their teachings or are they just a cut and paste expert? The more I see the living of the teachings, the more I trust the validity of the information. Um, the next question I hope isn't too boring for you, but for the audience and even for me for a review, can you just give us sort of a, just like we just talked about the archetypes, could you just give us like a, a definition of some of the common terms in astrology? Like what's the difference between a star, a planet, a moon, and a house? Because, uh, you know, uh, you know, like if you say to me, oh, my, my, my son is in the 12th house, uh, you know, to me, that sounds like you're speaking a completely different language. So maybe just so that people, when they hear these terms, they know they're not hearing a bunch of bullshit, airy fairy made up stuff. It actually has some kind of structural meaning to it. Yeah, you bet. Um, and also, before I jump into that, I had given you a link or I have some YouTube videos that talk about, um, you know, these basic fundamentals and we'll really introduce people to them solidly, but yeah, we'll speaking. put that on the show notes. You've got it right here. I Perfect. think uh, yeah. you so said you, guys, you, you wrote back to me and you gave me the link. So I'll get it to, to our guy yeah. that does the show notes. Yeah. So anyone who wants to like learn about this more should jump on that. So first of all, all the advanced mathematics that we have only was developed for astrological purposes like signs and cosines the when the western world brought those into the west those all came from you know astronomy books believe it or not yeah and probably from uh, the middle east i wouldn't doubt yeah middle east india and the reason being because um all this stuff houses planets you know signs are all very mathematically concrete mathematically calculated and therefore proven things okay so with um, what's a planet? Okay, well, a planet in modern terms, they have a definition of a planet. It's a satellite of the sun. Okay, in astrology, we don't use the word planet actually. Um, in, in Vedic astrology, we call it a graha. Now, a graha is something that captures, it grabs something, it captures something. So, the idea is in astrology, we have this circle of energy created by the earth revolving around the sun, okay? Now imagine this force of energy of the sun revolving around the earth or the earth revolving around the sun, however you want to see it. Think of that mass hurtling through space and how much force that is, right? And you really have to kind of get the awesomeness of this force, this of uh, momentum and gravity and speed and power that's happening simply by the earth and sun's revolution, okay? 
Yeah, I want to just interject something real quick. Here's a, a little thing I do with my students to show them exactly what you're talking about in a very simple demonstration. I say, take a quarter, a nickel, and a penny and put them in a triangle and hang a pendulum right in the middle and watch what happens. And you'll notice that the pendulum swings further toward the quarter and it swings further toward the nickel than it does toward the penny because that mass is a form of energy that's affecting the pendulum. So if you take the same concept, the sun is a massive body and different bodies in space have different amounts of energy. Therefore, if you think of space as in a medium like ether, call it water, <clears throat> if some 300 pounder jumps in the swimming pool, it can create waves that can knock a kid right off their feet. But if a little kid jumps in the pool, it doesn't knock big guys off their feet. So that's kind of, I'm just throwing that in to simplify that concept a little bit. Is that a working analogy? Yeah, it's good. We just have this force, this force of this circle. Okay. And this circle is considered to be a circle of pure consciousness. Okay. Divine it's just consciousness. This, it's pure consciousness. Then we have the planets in there. Sun, or then we have the planets. Um, and this circle is the perfect thing. Okay. Then we have the planets. Sun, uh, not sun, sorry, Earth, Moon, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and so on, revolving around the sun. And where they're at, they're capturing that energy and crystallizing it and defining it. And then, and, and then they're destroying the perfection of that unity. And that unity is the circle of God, you know? Yes. And that's necessary for us to have a conscious experience. Exactly, which is necessary to have a consciousness. So they capture the consciousness. So each of us is born at a time where the planets are capturing this consciousness of this circle in completely different ways. And that's why all of us have a different consciousness. We're all turned on by different things. We're all bored and excited. We all want, we all look different. How our body grows is a result of this, the planets, the consciousness they grab of this divine circle. Okay. So the planets are what define our consciousness ultimately, our personal consciousness. Okay. And so imagine you've got this circle and God says, you can pick seven pieces of this circle and that's you. You don't get to be the whole circle. Only I get to be that. Okay. But you get to be any seven little pieces of this tiny pinpricks on this circle. Stick seven pins in the circle. That's your consciousness. And that's what the planets do. Becoming the circle would be nirvana. The ocean, the drop back in the ocean, you're, you're gone. Exactly. So living is the product of those planets creating this crystallization of, of self-experience. Steiner, Steiner describes them as formative forces. Totally. You, they give form, you bet. Totally do. So the planets represent our unique individual purpose, okay? Yeah, I like that. All right. And of course, they're all calculated mathematically. Now, traditionally in astrology, they didn't use Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Now, those things are also important, but they're not operating on the same level, okay? Because they're not visible. You can't see them with the naked eye. They're working within a person. So they have a, a very important impact on our growth and our evolution, but they're not creating the concrete realities, the concrete experiences, the way we're built, the way we look, even the way we act. There are the forces that are driving all the other planets. The, you could say the behind the scenes forces driving all the other planets. Okay. So but most Vedic astrologers don't use those three planets. More and more are. I use them for certain things, but mostly with what I'm doing is working with the person in a way that they can grow. It's all about changing habits ultimately. And outer planets have nothing to do with their habits. They show when we're going to change a habit. They show the habits we're intent on changing, but they don't show the habit that needs to be changed. They don't show the growth that has to happen. So other planets actually do that. They just show that we're going to change it. Okay. In this lifetime. So they're really important in that. So, 
those are the invisible plants or the unseen plants. And they have to do with a lot more of the inner life than the externals. Would they be correlated to the subconscious? They are, but every planet has a subconscious aspect. The reason that is because the moon is a model of all the other planets. We only see one side of the moon, right? So with every planet, even though the other planets revolve and we see all sides of them, they're always reflecting light, only one side. They still have a dark side, right? Which is the unconsciousness. I see, good, yeah. So the side of the planet that's not reflecting the light is our subconsciousness. Right, and it's there. <laughs> so the, the Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto are kind of like the um, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, the creator, the preserver, and the destroyers. So... But they're planets too. Even though they threw Pluto out of the official NASA planet, you know, it's not considered a planet by astronomers anymore. Astrologically, it seems to really keep working as good as Uranus or Neptune, okay? Regardless of what they've said. Um, okay, so that's what the planets are. They're simply the bodies up there that are moving faster than the stars. That's the idea. The signs of the zodiac are basically, we take that circle, and in the ancient day, that circle was related to a, a diti, which means the unbroken, the divine mother, okay? And then she has 12 children called the adityas, which are each of those 12 children is 30 degrees of that circle. And that's, she's getting broken into 12 parts. You got it? Mm -hmm. Each of those parts is a zodiac sign. And each of those zodiac signs is a, di a differentiated aspect of the divine. Okay? But it doesn't stop there. We actually, in Vedic astrology, we take those 30 degrees of a zodiac sign and we chop it in half. And we give one sign to the moon deity and one, sign, one half to the sun deity. Then we cut it into three parts. And we give one part to this Rishi who likes to curse people. We give one part to this Rishi. Who, who is helping creation move along. And we give one part to a Rishi who creates all the things that last forever, that, that may make a long lasting impression on creation, you know, like languages and things like that. So, um, and then we divide into four parts and we give those to four different deities or divine forces. So we're, we constantly are breaking the zodiac down into smaller, smaller parts symbolized by further and further differentiations are basically the divine. Okay. All right. So the Zodiac is not just these 12 things. The Zodiac is very precise. Otherwise, if, if other, if the Zodiac was only these 12 signs, then within a 60 year period, every personality that could ever exist would be reborn. And every 60 years, we'd have the same type of people born. But of course, Astrology is actually so specific, it doesn't matter how many people are born for how long, there's never going to be two Xerox copies of each other. Even, even twins are not Xerox copies, right? No, nope. you're right, yep. Because when we break down that zodiac into these small little you know, forces, these small little energies of the divine, we get such an extreme level of differentiation, Okay. The more an astrologer can work within that level of differentiation, the more scientifically correct they are. The more they don't work out of that level of differentiation, the more important it is for their intuition to come through and make up for those lost, those unknown factors. Okay. So that's simply what the zodiac signs are, the vision of that circle. Okay. You just you just um gave me a a, a, a perception that I want to share real quick. It seems to me what you've just described is the reason that reading astrology out of a newspaper is way too unspecific because you're dealing with a global type reading as opposed to what's going on for me this month. Because even if you had identical twins who are born only minutes apart to the same parents, Based on what you said, they could actually be having very different influences at any given time, even though on the surface, they're both reading the newspaper and saying, I'm going to win the lottery this month or something like that. Exactly. So here's the beautiful thing about that, though. <laughs> okay. 
if we like take and we made everyone on earth read their sun sign every month, okay, in the newspaper and give a checkbox of yes was true or no was not true, we're not going to see any consistency at all. We're not going to see anything that makes astrology look like it's worth. Half the people will say true, half will say will say false. And then if we told them to read the, the sign for four months after their birth, the, you know, a sun sign, say you're in Aries, tell them, oh, read cancer. Now tell us if that was what was true for you last week. And we'll get the same response. Okay. But the thing, the reality is everyone doesn't read those sun signs, right? Everyone doesn't read those sun signs every day of the, every week of the, every week of their lives. What happens though, the beauty of it is one time you're sitting there by the airport board and there's a newspaper and you open up and for some reason you decide to read your sun sign and it actually comes out true, you know? Right. So there's an impulse from the soul. Exactly. And so the reason sun signs are popular, why people have them is because statistically, if we, if we really tested them, they would work. But because it, the people reach for them because the, their soul is communicating that to them. You know, or they go to YouTube one month and they, oh, I'm going to listen to what this astrologer has to say about something that statistically wouldn't even work, but it happens to apply to them. So there's still value in these things that scientifically are not going to pan out across a wide spectrum of experiences. If only 20, if 90% of the people who it's going to work for the, are the people who read it, then it'll seem true, right? Yes. I think intuition really is something that comes from behind a lot of the laws that that we could say are at play in the mental sphere because really intuition is drawing from wholeness or drawing from the consciousness of god it's it's not like a calculated response or it's not intuition so I think what you're describing is all of a sudden someone says, geez, I just have the urge to look at this video or read this astrology reading. That's coming from behind the mathematical, logical reasoning that leads a lot of people to negate astrology altogether. And, and even some of these people will actually occasionally pick up and read it and just for curiosity's sakes and find, oh, that seems very interesting. That's what's going on in my life. But they won't go tell their students that. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you a real funny story along those lines. So I was a kid growing up, um, you know, I was like a paper boy. We never got the newspaper. I was living in papers and I was like 12. Right. And, um, you know, I would, I would see the Zodiac there and I, I would, and in my paper on your birthday, they always wrote this big thing on your birthday that was about you and what you were like. And every, I would think, oh, I can't wait till my birthday comes out. On my birthday, I'm going to read that part. And for like five years, I wanted to do that. And every single time on my birthday, I forgot to read it. <laughs> and so I never read my birthday interpretation in the newspaper. And, I, and, and then a week later, I go, oh, I forgot. Of course, that newspaper is long gone, you know. And so um, I never read that. And then when I was 16... I, I was browsing a, a bookstore for some fantasy books to read while I was recovering from training, you know, and I found all these astrology calculation books, you know, the ephemeris, how to calculate the houses and the planets. And I want, I really wanted to buy them, but they were like 70 bucks. And I like, I need that for tires and entry fees. You know, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to spend $70 on, on, on this stuff. And then it was five years later that that, four and a half, five years later that that lady gave me all that stuff. So I really wonder if I had maybe read my sun signs and has seen how ridiculous it was. Oh, yeah. It might have distracted you. If I, when that, my friend had said, you want to have an astrology reading? I might have said, hell no. Uh-huh. You know, because I might have said, oh, this is BS. It's like, so I really think it's interesting. I was so passionate. I so much wanted to read that part. And I every year I was so bummed at myself that I forgot. So I think my soul was making me forget during that week and wouldn't let me remember I wanted to do that until I threw the newspaper away. You know? That's so good. And you know, I think what I love about the story and what I love about everything you've shared 
is that it all goes back to really listening deeper in ourselves on every level of our life and not relying on so much calculation because calculations can only be based on what people know and what people know is almost always yesterday's information so if we if we find ourselves at a place in our life where it seems like everything's falling apart and nothing's working no matter who we listen to i find often that's because we keep repeating the same beliefs habits and behaviors over and over again even when we're meant to be at other places fulfilling other aspects of soul contracts or the environment's changing but we're in routines we're kind of like a groundhog that forgot to look at the sun kind of thing and therefore doesn't follow the natural cycles that are being given to it in the moment definitely you know turmeric's really really hot now there's a lot of scientific research on it but they're not all created the same so i brought autumn smith on to tell you about paleo valley's turmeric complex so you know exactly what the benefits are and why you, like me, should get your turmeric complex from Paleo Valley. Autumn, tell us about your turmeric complex. At Paleo Valley, we are big believers in food as medicine. And so turmeric, of course, it has beat drugs out. We know it's anti-inflammatory. We know it has brain benefits. We know it has joint benefits. But what most people don't know is that a lot of turmeric supplements only contain one isolated compound of turmeric called curcumin. And so what we did instead was create a complex. We added organic turmeric and then ginger and rosemary and clove, which were some of the most DNA protective spices studied. And we created a complex. We added organic coconut powder and pepper for absorption. And so we've created a really high quality, highly bioavailable turmeric complex that will hopefully help you to feel your best. And all you have to do to check it out is go to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K-15 to save 15%. Did you talk about the houses? I can't okay, remember. Okay, so let's talk about So that's what the plants are in the signs. Now, what the houses are, we have those zodiac signs, okay? That's this ecliptic, which is the path that the sun seems to take. Now, within that, we have the earth. And the earth is rotating on its axis. So at any given time, the point on the zodiac that's on the eastern horizon is different. And as the earth rotates... Every four minutes, the point on the zodiac changes by one degree. Every two hours, the point on the zodiac goes from one sign to the next sign. Okay. This is because of the angle of the Earth's rotation? Is that what it is? Um, Actually. Angle of the axis? No, it's simply because imagine you have a circle of 12 sides, and there's a, a sphere rotating inside. As that sphere rotates, if you're on that circle... The part, the sign you're going to see is going to change as the sphere rotates, right? So you're talking about Saturn rotating or the moon or, or any. No, no, the earth rotates. Oh, the earth's rotating. So it's There's a ca- circle. changing our perspective on everything. Exactly. Else. So the circle is the zodiac with the planets and the earth is rotating inside that. If you're on the earth looking out your window, what you're going to see out the window changes as the rotation happens, right? It's like you're standing on a merry-go-round that's spinning. Exactly. So, but the the way it works is that because the earth is at an angle on the axis, the circle, if we take this as the, the equator, the circle is like this. Twenty. It's it, 23 it's, degrees, it's not, isn't it? It's not like this. It's 23 point something degrees. Yeah. About 23 degrees. So it's at an angle. So the way it's calculated, there's basically certain points. The the point that's rising on the eastern part of Earth, that's your first house or your rising sign. The part that's setting on the west is your seventh house. The part that if you look straight up, if you were standing, you look straight up, that's your 10th house. And if you looked right down through your feet, that's your fourth house. So based on where you are on earth at that moment, we create a 
circle around you with four points, the above point, the below point, the east point, and the west point. And then we divide those four points into three points, into three parts. So three times four is 12, and we get 12 houses. Now, what the houses do, they represent the different areas of life, like the area of family, the area of relationships, the area of health, the area of, of our work. Money. Basically, the things in life. And the Sanskrit words they use for house is a baba, which means the concrete existing thing. So we have a house that rules your children. We have a house that rules your vehicle. Everything that concretely exists is ruled by one of the houses. I see. Okay? So houses rule multiple things because everything is ruled by, is represented by a house. But planets get involved in a house and make different things. So... The moon will get involved with your fourth house and make your mother. Venus will get involved with your fourth house and make a vehicle. Okay. <laughs> well, Jupiter we need all those get, things. Yeah. Jupiter gets involved with the fourth house and is going to make, make your bank account. Okay. Mars gets involved with your fourth house and builds you a house and gives you a piece of land. So that's why the houses can give so many things because the planets all involve differently with them. And many things are given by actually multiple planets. Like why is a car different than a horse, right? Yes. Well, because a car has a motor, so you also need a motor to come along to your fourth house. So it gets very intricate, you know? So the houses are the concrete things that are produced by the planets. The planets are the makers of the things of the houses, but the houses are the things that everyone is so focused on. Now, what's most important, though, of all these three things is the zodiac sign, the sign itself, because that's the, really, that's the, that's the, let's say, the archetypical energy that's closest to God. That's our mission. So say you have Aries on your seventh house. The seventh house is the house of partnerships. So you're going to go and have partnerships. Like, that's what the seventh house does. But if Aries is on your seventh house, your mission in partnerships is to discover who you really are. If you have Taurus on the seventh house, you have partnership, but your mission in that partnership is a completely different mission. So we're only successful in our lives when we achieve the mission of the sign, not the mission of the house. <laughs> you know, The house is the medium through which we achieve. It's the, it's the path that we're going to achieve the mission on. Right. So it's kind of like a car is a vehicle, but you're really learning how to drive. It doesn't matter whether you're driving a Volkswagen or a, a, a expensive sports car. It's all driving and you're either getting better at it or you're not. Exactly. Yeah. And so the Zodiac signs is what, we, what we're really here to experience. And some, so, then one thing I didn't mention that's really important, there's two planets they're, they're not really planets. Rahu and K to the north and south nodes of the moon. This is these are really and critically important. They only started using them in Western astrology recently, relatively recently, but they've been part of Vedic astrology forever. They're like a unique contribution to Western astrology from Vedic astrology. And with the nodes of the moon, those are the points that the eclipses happen, and they're basically the the points of intersection of the sun circle and the moon circle. And those are the two lights. The light, sun is the light of the soul. The moon is the light of your individuality, which is a reflection of the soul. So just as the, the sun can shine and, and you can have reflections in every lake of the sunlight, that's what the moon is. The reflections can be numerous, but the source is one. So the light of the soul is the sun. The light of you as an individual is the moon. And where those two lights cross, the light of soul with the light of your individuality, that's your north and south nodes. Mm. And those, that's, the, that's the environment that we're born to experience. That's the road we need to travel for our consciousness to develop, for our individual consciousness to embrace greater divine consciousness. And so the sign that you're Rahu or Ketu in, that's your biggest mission, you know? Yeah, very and, interesting. Yeah, so that's also a really important part of the of the astrologically astrological thing machine. What I love about it is that you know when you spend time with someone like yourself, 
you know, the whole concept of it begins to speak to your soul. Like I, I am, I'm getting my own questions answered. And even though I've studied a lot more than most people have, I haven't even touched what you've done because that's your profession. Just like I know a lot about a lot of things that other people don't know. We all do. Right. And I, I think what I wanted to bring to people with this podcast is exactly what you're giving us. And I'm very grateful for that because, you know, anyone that listens to what we've been saying is getting a lot of interesting lessons that all point back to just a few key principles. And they're, you know, the principle of consciousness as an expression of the divine, but the fact that without the structure of the universe, we wouldn't really have any way to have an individual experience. And that we're actually agents of divine consciousness living out an experience that's completely and utterly unique that no one else can live out. And that we are not separate from everything around us. The ego creates the illusion that I'm here and the moon's there, but the moon really lives inside of you. The sun lives inside of you. And their life is your life. And paradoxically, the same stars and the same moons and the same constellations are living a different life in all of us, even though they're the same, which is like, we're all the same, but we're all different. And I, I think when you start getting down to the essence of it all, you can really start to see that, that it's, it's a science that needs to be backed by a healthy intuition in the astrologer, because the science alone can't take you where intuition coupled with science can take you. Is that a fair statement? Currently it is. The reason is because there's a lot of work to be done on a scientific level with astrology still, you know, um, see astrology, you know, we talked about the ages, the electrical age for 2200 more years, right? And then we're going to go into the magnetic age. Astrology won't be perfected until the magnetic age as a science, you know? Well, we got a lot to learn for sure then. Yeah. And same with even like medical science. We have so much to learn in, in all the sciences, nutrition, medicine, everything is in a boom right now. It's an exciting pioneering time in every scientific field. Um, so we have to work with what we have and, and we're going to continue to create better, um, better science on all levels for the future generation. I love it. Medical astrology is a whole branch. And I know you have knowledge on that because that's how I really learned how good you were other than my own reading. Could you just maybe give us a real short kind of compacted understanding of how it is that medical astrology works? Okay. Like I know, for example, Leo relates to the heart because I'm, you know, I always want to know, well, I'm born August the 24th, which is right between Leo and Virgo. So I'm wondering like, well, what is that in my body? So, and I've got charts on this and things like that, but maybe you could just, for the listeners, give us a description of how and why that works. Yeah. So basically, um, different signs represent different areas of the body, um, different organs, different planets represent different flows of energy in our body that are, you know, energizing our organs, energizing our health. Um, and so, you know, different um, planets are dry, some are hot, some are moist, you know, they have different energies, different planets work in harmony with each other, some work in disharmony with each other. So based with all that, we, we basically have medical labels for all the planets and all the things this on a medical basis, just like Venus rules vehicles on a, you know, on a practical basis, and it rules relationships, it also is going to rule a certain element and therefore have a medical effect. So it's just basically we do the same thing as we do with any other system of astrology. We just are assigning different things to it. And so if a person has, you know, let's say if a person has problems in their lungs or large intestines, we know that there's going to be something going on with their Saturn because that's the plant that's governing the healthy use of those organs. Okay. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's just like that, basically, that we determine those things. And of course, based on the planetary positions, we're basically looking at the congenital weaknesses. You know, we're all born with stronger organs, weaker organs, but see, those grew out of our consciousness. 
ultimately all the planets, which are the things doing everything, everything in our charts produced by the planets. And the planets are our consciousness, as I explained. So we have genetically stronger and weaker organs, diseases because of what's happening in our consciousness. And if we heal what's in our consciousness, then we heal the organ. And so, as you said earlier, that the planets are formative forces. And so those formative forces are also informing or creating the structure of our whole body and everything oh, in totally. it. Oh, totally. You bet. Yeah, our body is directly grown out of our consciousness. That's why we can read your palms, your hands, your body, and we can tell things about a person because, you know, our body grows as a result of our consciousness. Yes. Um, that's very, very fascinating. You know, just because we're running short on time, there's one thing I want to get to before I give you a big air hug. Um, you know, I, I put your prediction in my 2022, uh, podcast. It was called lover's Boot Camp. It turned out to be almost five hours, but I just felt that there was things I had to share and I got a lot of great feedback on it, but you know, it goes without saying that we're in some pretty turbulent times today. And if you could use your skills as an astrologer to tell us what the stars are saying about this time on earth and in the evolution of man, what would be the general forecast for the next 10 or 20 years? Like from an astrological perspective, why are we going through all this craziness? Uh, and where is it taking us to based on your wisdom? You know, I wish I could answer that question for you, but the reality is um, it's really, really time consuming to look at a, a year of life on Earth on a collective level. I mean, it, we're talking it's the amount of charts that has to be calculated. They all have to be calculated for any place on Earth that's a player, you know, who's a big player. And um, that you know, to try to do that for 10 or 20 years, I just don't have the time. I, I mostly work on an individual basis with people, with psychics. I try to heal people one at a time. I hardly have any time after that to really throw myself into world events. Um, you know, it could be like a full-time job, literally, you know, if a person really wants to do that. Um, I have looked a bit at, I try to keep up on the year that's happening. Um, I did predict the COVID thing happening two years before it happened. Um, because of the eclipse that happened around that time. But um, so what I can say about world events is that, first of all, um, and I think most people, this is such an obvious prediction, it's stupid to make it, you know, Russia shouldn't have any problem winning this little war they're on. A lot of people are making this war seem like a really big deal. Um, I don't consider it a big deal in comparison to what's going to be happening. Um, I feel like this is just, you know, this is just like a pre-act to what we have what looking forward to us this year. Um, we had a really rough Lunar New Year this year that's going to show a lot of lack throughout the world, a short lot of shortage around the world, um, a, lot of, um, a lot of efforts to make things work that aren't going to work. You know, we're, leaders are going to be called idiots more this year than they have been in a long time, okay? There is, you know... Um, the um, a lot of lack. I expect the real estate value prices in the United States to go down this year. Um, we have some pretty important eclipses coming up. One is the um, two eclipses coming up. One's April six, April thirtieth. Other one's May sixteenth. Um, those are kind of coming at the same time. They're kind of together. One's a solar. One's a lunar. So. Around that time, what we're going to expect, one of the eclipses is an eclipse that's all about solving problems. We got problems and we got to fix them. The problem is the way eclipse charts work is we literally use these cycles of eclipse that can run 1,300 years. And every 18, about every 18 years, an eclipse repeats itself. And so when this cycle starts, the next, you know, many, many eclipses, are gonna all have the same basic theme, okay? So one of these spring eclipses this year has a theme of there's problems and they need to get fixed, okay? So that's the basic theme. The biggest problem we've had is this COVID problem on a global level, you know? 
Deeper than that, we have a bigger problem called the understanding of modern medical science, okay? <laughs> Which is a podcast of, of <laughs> humor all on itself. And so then we basically, we have a severe problem that has to do with health, put it simply. And um, the problem is the eclipse chart of this cycle, of this particular eclipse that's happening now, problem solving eclipse that's happening now, is a problem that it's it's just bad news. It's not going to be solved. If, it, if this eclipse was a good eclipse chart, it would mean they solved the problem. Okay? But it's not. It's a, it's a, it, this eclipse actually has what I call an idiot combination, which means if you have it in your birth chart, everything you try to do, you, you do it in a way that's so idiotic, it's guaranteed to fail. Okay? So at that point, you know, what is an idiot? An idiot is someone who does something when they should do nothing and they mess it up. You know, that's what you're, you're trying to fix your car and your four-year-old comes over and starts playing with all those bearings. And you're like, oh, you fucking idiot. You know, you get mad at him. Hopefully you don't, but that happens, right? Yeah. So the definition of an idiot is you, you, you touch something, you play with something, you muck with something, you try to do something with something when you shouldn't even touch it. You mean like human genes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that too. And so we, this eclipse, which is about solving problems, has an idiot combination in it. That's the whole eclipse revolves around don't do anything, stop. Don't touch anything. So hopefully some countries will learn from this. See, on every, this eclipse is going to affect every country differently depending where that country is and what house the eclipse falls in. So some countries will realize we got to stop, we got to distance ourselves to just get our hands off. Other countries are going to stick their hands into the pie and muck it up worse. Okay. But it's a time where we need a hands off policy on this whole COVID thing. We need to just leave it alone. Everything they're doing is just making things worse. Yep. And we know that the people behind it are, have all sorts of ulterior motives, and maybe they're the idiots mucking it up. Yeah. Whatever the authorities are trying to do. If they should, the more they try, the more they're going to screw things up. When you know they need to stick out of it, they're way out of their league. They don't understand what's happening. They don't have the wisdom. We think about it, we got a bunch of politicians who are economically centered people who are dealing with a medical crisis, using advice from doctors who know nothing about health. If that's not a circle of idiots, I don't know. Yeah, one of my favorite memes that was going around is why do the hell why the hell would anyone think that Bill Gates is going to get rid of a virus when he can't keep them out of his own computers? I'm like, we got Bill Gates now running the government and the medical system and the financial system, and I'm like, you know, wake up people, this is this is what happens when people get too much money and you give them too much power and they start trying to be an expert at everything, it's bad news. Yeah. And also, I think one of the big issues we have in this country, too, along the lines of idiocy, is we have a history of presidents who have no military experience. Yes, that's another problem. Dealing with global affairs, sending people into war, sending people to go shoot at other people when they've never shot at other people themselves. Or been shot at. I, I bet if we resurrected all those dudes who signed the Declaration of Independence and wrote the Constitution, and we said... Can you ever envision a day where a president would not be a military man? And they, they would, would have said, no. no, I can't even imagine that would happen. Yeah. A president needs to know economics, health, and military. He should have experience in three of those areas. Otherwise, he's going to be an absolute failure. That's just my opinion. So anyway, the world problem of the world now, we, it needs to be hands-off. It's like someone who's never had sex writing books on sex. Exactly. You know? So hopefully, so some countries are going to get the hands off and they're going to let things flow. They're going to do well. But the countries who are still going to try to involve themselves with the COVID problem are just going to create more and more long-term problems. And the long-term problems are going to be an increase of chronic diseases and on levels that we've never seen before if they keep up this nonsense. So that's one issue. So unfortunately, this eclipse is not going to help us solve any problems. The other eclipse that's happening at the same time, it's an eclipse of, of authority. 
who do you give your authority to? You give your authority to who you believe in. Okay? So we have an eclipse. The first one on April 30th is an eclipse of changing your belief system and therefore changing who your authority is, who you're going to take as the authority, right? Now, this is going to have huge impact relevant to COVID for one, because people have been deciding, I believe in doctors, therefore they're my authority. This is the eclipse that's going to result in people recognizing this authority is not valid anymore. Amen. So this is going to be a huge eye awakener. It's really interesting as a personal example, these eclipses happen every 18 years, right? Two eclipse, this eclipse, when it happened two cycles ago, on the day of that eclipse, that eclipse landed on the planet that represents my father. And that's the day my mother showed up and said, I'm divorcing your father. And in one flash of an instant, I went to this belief that my parents were responsible, capable people who I can always count on to recognizing I can't count on these people. I have to do everything right myself. And in that one moment, I completely changed as a person to becoming a completely self-sufficient, self-resourceful person who takes care of everything all the time. My belief system of who has to be the authority changed. To me, instead of my parents, in one blink of an eye. That's the nature of this eclipse. That's great. So anyone who gets hit by this eclipse, and not everyone will get actually hit by it independently. You have to see if the eclipse is going to land on a planet for you. You're going to go, wow, why am I being responsible for this? Why am I letting these people be responsible for me? And they'll have a shift in their belief system. And so this eclipse will hit a lot of people. And as a result, it'll have a global impact of a movement of shifting who the authority is in our lives. And in my, what's really funny to me, we used to be the clergy was the authority, right? We've replaced the clergy as our authority with the medical doctors as our authority. The soul ultimately needs to be the authority. Amen. You know, and that's the only useful authority. So people will be making shifts in who the authority is. And that's the beautiful part about this eclipse. This is the nice part of the eclipse that's coming up these two, okay? Now, the scary thing is, um, the thing that has me more concerned is that the eclipse that's happening in the fall, okay, this one is, let me just double check October 25th, okay. Just real quickly, I haven't studied this one as much, I haven't had as much time, but the eclipse in the fall is a is a more um, it's a more fanatical eclipse. It's an eclipse, I'm gonna do this, I have to do this, and I don't care the cost. Okay. Um, and in this eclipse, we're gonna see, I think this eclipse, which is end of October, beginning of November, there's two of them. They're always two weeks apart is going to be the eclipse that's going to really be important for all this war stuff that's going on. I think that a lot of countries are going to be completely getting, you know, renegotiating their um, agreements with other countries, especially the United States is going to develop very different diplomatic relationships with countries as a result of the October, November eclipses. This is an eclipse that could trigger a lot more, um, acts of war than what's happening now you know um this eclipse is 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 definitely a more militant fanatical let's let's change who we're um let's change who our friends are let's change who our commitments are and people who are getting hit by this on a personal level will be running off with other people to marry and countries who are getting hit by this We'll be saying, you're not my friend anymore. I'm in a, I'm sleeping with China now, or I'm sleeping with this country now. So God we're going to see a lot of renegotiations amongst countries of who, where their loyalties belong with respect to each other. And we're also going to see that in people's personal lives who get hit by that, where you're like, wait, I'm not, I'm not going to be loyal with you anymore. I'm going to be loyal to this part of my life, whether it's my job, myself, my, another lover, we're going to see change of loyalties and it's a fanatical thing it's like nothing's going to stop me i don't care if my kids never talk to me i don't care what the if i lose my job i'm going to do this and the countries who are hit by this they're like i don't care what happens i'm going to i'm going to do this crazy shit you know 
So this is an eclipse of, of extreme possible changes. Sounds volatile. It can be very volatile, very fanatical in personal lives if you get hit and on a global level. So in the United States, it's going to show a lot of, um, like I said, new negotiations, change of change of um, who the United States is going to sleep with, who they're going to make their friends, who they're going to take care of. We're going to see a lot of changes in respect to that. Um, what's such a sad thing to me is just how when you, when you live around the world like I have, um, you really see how different the news is in, in America compared to other countries. Oh, boy, do I know that. I've seen it. I travel the world. Yeah. Just an example. If you look, and I'm not a Hitler. I'm not political. I don't like anybody. I like the planets. Everyone else doesn't matter to me. Yeah. I'm with but if you. you go and you search Hitler and then you click on images and you look at the pictures of Hitler, you cannot find a single picture of Hitler where he doesn't look mean. I'm sure there was one day in his life that he looked nice, you know, because I've known some real evil people and I remember them looking nice a lot of the time. But, you know, just the idea of how we report the news in America, um, you know, like Putin is reported as a fanatic. You know, it's like we love the, the bullshit. And then you look at a person's chart and you read their palm and, and you read their face and you realize the media bullshit that's going on to make somebody seem like a, you know, portrays people out of character, you know, that you can't trust your media in America. And really most countries, America is really, really bad, actually. But anyway, um, but, it, you know, so there's a lot of news whenever war goes on. There's all this fear of fanatics, 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 fanatics. Well, the reality is in the eclipse that's coming up in end of October, early November, that can, that's actually an eclipse of people becoming fanatical, of taking fanatical steps. So we have some intense stuff to look to towards the end of this year. And so um, that I think is going to be much more impactful than what's happening this week in Ukraine. And I haven't had the time to look into who the players are or any of that stuff. I'm getting a very basic idea because I'm so busy with teaching the self-help astrology, or whatever you want to call it, the transformational astrology, that it's really hard for me to spend the hours it takes to dig up these charts, you know, and, and calculate everything. I think you've given us what you're saying sits well in me. If I just empty myself as I listen to you talk, I, I, feel, I feel like I'm hearing an honest forecast and there's a million things I could say, but we're pretty far in now. And I'm sure you probably need to get to the toilet <laughs> oh, <laughs> after sitting but, for three but, hours. One thing I want to say about the eclipse, the facts of the eclipse can happen in the month before. So we can start okay. expecting to see the fall eclipses the end, starting around March 30th. You can start seeing the effects of this in your life. You might start questioning your authorities then. You might realize if you're getting hit by the authority eclipse. If you're getting hit by the, um, and also it's a responsibility eclipse. Who am I going to be responsible for? Who's responsible for me? That'll kick in um, March 30th till about May 30th. That will be, if you get hit by that, that'll be what's going on in your life. If you're getting hit by the idiot eclipse, it's like, that will be from like March 15th to um, June 15th will be when that eclipse has the most weight. That'll be when, yeah, you're, People are getting hit by that eclipse are going to have to realize, just stop. Don't make things work. There's, there's a time to stop on things. There's a time to not do anything. And if you're getting hit by an eclipse, that's what I'll, you'll start realizing is I got to stop doing this to myself, to this person, whatever. Fantastic. Um, Ernst, I can't remember if you were going to do any offerings for the listeners on programs or anything like that. Is there any, uh, any offerings you wanted to make? You know, the, um, the one offer I have... I don't really, I don't even know how to think along the lines of making special offers. I mean, I, I saw all my stuff, honestly, at a fraction of what other people charge for a class. Yeah, you don't you know, have I, to. I have classes with, I have classes that have a hundred hours of audio in them. Yeah. I charge $108 for the class. Yeah, yeah, I understand. You know, so it's like, I don't give discounts. My software is less than anyone else's. The only discount I give is, I also teach a system of card reading where you find your birth spread based on your birth date. If people like to sign up for the cards website and the astrology website, 
if they sign up for six months or 12 months at a time and they pay with a check or money order, I give them both for free. So that's 300 for a year instead of 600 for a year. Great. And with that, they can study all day long, 24-7 for $300 a year. I'm like the cheapest dude out there, you know? Okay. Well, maybe what you could do just to make that simple is write up that offer so we can put it in the show notes so people know exactly where to click or how to go about doing that. Okay. I'll let you know that. Okay. Here's my last question for you. If you were going to die today and you knew it and you got a chance right now to give a message to the world, what's your message? You know, I would just say, think of God, you know, and literally I would say, I really know I would say that from experience because at the end of the day, we need to remember what's really happening that this whole universe is a manifestation of God. There's nothing else to really think of. And it, it's important to try to be aware of that whatever we're thinking about, it's it's an aspect of God too. When I think about you, I'm thinking about an aspect of God. When I'm thinking about that tree, when I'm thinking about making a video, I'm just thinking about God manifesting this universe. And I think learning to see life that way, developing faith that life is that way, really makes the difference because that's what keeps us from getting wrapped up in all the drama that pulls us away from ourselves. without faith and that and understanding that everything is a greater something we don't listen to our soul we get scared we get fearful we step out of ourselves we lose our center and we can't hear what our soul is trying to tell us so i think developing the faith of recognizing that all that matters is that there's a force that's eternal, making everything happen. And um, and if we keep that as a constant memory, it's going to solve a lot of our problems and make us live our lives a lot more successfully and overcome our fears. I had this um, dream last year where I was having a picnic with my family in a park and all of a sudden we all look and there's this like thing coming out of the sky. And it felt like real. one of those dreams that felt so real. There's this thing coming out of the sky. And as we look, we're all like, wow, it's a nuclear missile. Uh It's coming right for us. And a lot of people just start running and scampering around. I just just sat there and and what came into my consciousness was, I love you, God. And then there was no fear in my dream, just peace and this feeling of love for God. The missile hit and that was it, you know? And it was like really nice to have this experience of just that coming to my mind. And I've had near-death experiences where I've almost got crumpled, you know? And that's what always came, right? It's like, wasn't a fear. It was just, I love you, God. I get you. You exist. Just this centeredness and peace, even in these experiences that cause a lot of fear. When they end me, I'm like calm. I'm not even scared. I'm not even nervous, you know? I'm just like, I just keep doing what I'm doing like it never happened. So we need to develop this faith and learn to see everything as an aspect of God, you know? Yeah, I agree. And I'm paralleling with you. And if I had more time, I would talk to you about your vision because I've had very similar ones. Um, cool. <laughs> but uh, maybe in private, we can do that so I don't scare the shit out of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, wow. Hey, that was a freaking awesome podcast. I really appreciate that, Ernst. It's so nice to be back in touch with you again. And just, I just love the depth of your wisdom and your honesty. I I really, I just say namaste, my friend, I'm grateful for you. And thank you for being yourself and being so true to yourself because it's just such a great example for all of us. And I'm so grateful that you've devoted yourself to such deep understanding, wisdom, and practice of your art of astrology, because just even in three hours with you, I feel like I've gotten more than I could have got in 300 hours of reading books. So that was my dream is to help everybody have a deeper understanding of not just astrology, but life, consciousness, the soul, and and you brought the goods full on. So um, I hope people uh, track down your books and your courses and can people still get readings from you or have you stopped doing that? It's, it's really hard for me to have time. Um, I've been so overwhelmed the last couple of years. I'm hoping by, you know, about another year, I'll be in a place where I can start handling some more, some more readings, 
I've just had so many things I had to take care of in, in respect to my father and personal life that I mean, I spent weeks where I didn't sleep for three weeks and I can't do a reading when I don't sleep for three weeks. No, you know? hell no, yeah. But when I get caught up, um, it'll be on my website when I get back to where I can actually have the time and energy to do some more readings. Well, you've given us a great reading on many <laughs> okay. levels. So you've done a great job. Um, thank you to my sponsors for your love and support and for your sustainable practices. Thank you to the listeners for sharing the episodes and being brave enough to grow with me and Ernst and all the great guests that I have. And thank you for anything you buy from the sponsors because it supports the podcast with a little commission. And uh, hey, let's all let's all do this together. You know, it's the world's always been crazy, but that doesn't mean we have to be. And I think if anything, we can do what Ernst says, just realize it's all God. And to the degree we realize that we know love is the ultimate medicine for everything. So when you're stressed and scared and you're not sure what to do, just hold still and ask yourself, what would love do now? And listen to your heart, not your head, and you'll be okay. Because the worst thing that'll happen is you'll die and you'll figure it all out. <laughs> 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 the truth shall be known. Yeah, exactly. The worst thing that's going to happen, you'll figure it all out in an instant. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and you'll back, back to the divine ocean. So Ernst, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, somewhere along the way, I got to do another podcast with you and we'll get into maybe some more specifics on things where we can unpack something, yeah. you know, sure. instead that of was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the time to connect with you. That was really special. Yeah. Thank Long you. Overdue. Yeah. Stay in, <laughs> stay in touch and make sure if you're coming my way, you let me know so I can share Definitely. everything with you and give you a big hug. Sounds wonderful. I look forward to it. All right, bud. Lots of love. All right, bro. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Ernst Wilhelm. You can find Ernst's books, software, and audios at his Vedic Astrology website. Go to bit.ly forward slash Vedic Astrology with Ernst. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Vedic Astrology with Ernst, all lowercase. To get a customized report, such as a relationship and compatibility report or a financial timing report, visit his Vault of the Heavens website at bit.ly forward slash Vault of the Heavens. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Vault of the Heavens, all lowercase. You can watch Ernst's videos at astrology-videos.com, cardsoftruth.com or on his YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Diva Prashna. That's D-E-V-A-P-R-A-S-H-N-A. -A Remember, you can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Follow Paul Check on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at Paul Check, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Check Institute's new media site, checkiva.com. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast.